Okay, everybody. Hello. This is uh, our discussion on Calvinism. Uh, you know, like I said to these guys before we started recording, it might be something like mere Calvinism or surprised by Calvinism, you know, so uh, we're just going to fly by the wing of our pants and see, see where it goes. Um, this is my first randos discussion. I think that it's Kalen's first randos discussion and maybe, um, oh gosh, I already forgot how to pronounce your name. You go ahead and introduce yourself. Like Anamik, it's she's been in a couple, I think. But uh, yeah, here we are. Do you guys want to introduce yourselves? Oh, sure. Uh, like, uh, how far would you like me to go? I can say, oh, hi, I'm Anamik. <laughs> uh, I'm a, I'm a university student. Uh, I grew up Calvinist, and I still am one. <laughs> That's about it. I mean, I can go into more detail later. Sure. Okay, and I'm Kaylin, and I grew up, I guess from what people have told me, it's more Baptist, I guess, but they consider themselves non-denominational, but under the broad category of Protestantism. And I'm kind of um, searching things out right now, so I don't know what I would call myself, but I guess I'm still in the Protestant camp for right now, at least. All right. Um, and I just realized I didn't introduce myself. I'm Colton. Um, yeah, the Colton from the Discord, the, the one who talks about Calvinism constantly. Um, and uh, I was a atheist agnostic for most of my life. Um, and then about a year and a half ago, I uh, started getting interested in big questions. Um, then about a year ago, I'd say I converted to Christianity. And uh, I went through a couple phases that we'll talk about in this discussion, but I settled on Presbyterianism, and that's where I'm at right now. Let's so, story. Okay, all right. So this will be my yeah. This will be my first video, and I guess I'll go ahead and give my the whole shebang. Uh, I was born in Illinois, Southern Illinois, rural Illinois. So I got the standard like Midwestern, um, you know, American traditional values type, you know, upbringing. Um, I was not raised religiously, though. Both of my parents were religious and they both kind of fell away from the faith. My dad um, in college. And then my mom, when she was with my dad, uh, kind of, he didn't go to church. So she didn't go to church. And then I never went to church except a couple times with my grandmother when I was a little kid. So I had really no, uh, or very little exposure to Christianity outside the culture that I lived in, like movies and books and things like that. You know, I would watch the Lord of the Rings hundreds of times over as a little kid, but I never went, Oh, that's Christian you know, but I was getting exposure to, you know, Christianity because of, you know, where I was raised and, you know, what, what I was, you know, consuming and, and all that. But I, I definitely never went, oh yeah, this is a Christian movie, which I would do now. Right. Um, Can I ask I, a question real quick? Yeah. Yeah. So you said your parents fell away from the faith. Were they Christian? Yeah. Oh, okay. Yeah, my dad was Protestant or Catholic yeah, both or... of them. Both of them were Protestants. My dad was in the United Church of Christ, which is kind of like a Presbyterian offshoot, I think. Um, long ago, though, it happened a long time ago. I don't know, they're Presbyterian adjacent, I think. I don't know about their theology, just like kind of the, the church, like, I don't know, uh, format. Sort of mainstreamy? Uh, uh, yeah, 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 yeah. The, kind uh, of mainstream. Yeah, yeah. Kind of named kind of mainstream yeah um okay my mom was a baptist so not mainstream not not denominate i mean other than the fact that baptist churches are all over or non-denoms or whatever but um she was at some small uh baptist church in highland illinois uh she originally was from minnesota uh moved down here when she was eight um but I don't know what she attended up there. I just know down here she attended a Baptist church for a long time, um, or at least when she was a kid. Uh, and so they were both Protestant and both kind of, uh, 
you know, fell away. My dad like went through confirmation and everything. And he, you know, he went to church and, um, he, I, judging by his actions in high school and stuff, or even before high school, I can tell you that he wasn't really the most devout Christian, but he did like, you know, think it was important and everything. And he would go to church and stuff, but in college, he got the kind of like secular slap in the face and kind of was like, Oh, religion is stupid. And then stop believing in it um and then my mom i think just kind of slowly like anemically like faded away from the church as she grew up and kind of got away and didn't have to go anymore and stuff and then my dad didn't go like i said so well she didn't really have a lot of reason to um so i got luckily the the morality or at least some of it of christianity instilled into me because both of my parents were raised in the church I kind of benefited secondhand, even though I wasn't raised a Christian, I had Christian sympathies, at least morally speaking. Um, So uh, I was a lot of times in school, I, you know, you might can, people might consider me like old fashioned or kind of like, you know, I was a conservative. We'll get into that. But like, I, I just had a, I just had an older generation type morality because my parents were raised in the church and, and, and I got some of that through them. Um, and I'm really thankful for that. And, you know, even though my parents weren't Christian, I'm, I'm glad that they, they gave me those values. Um, it helped a lot coming into the faith because I didn't have to rework everything. I knew some of it clicked like, Oh, that's the reason I should believe that. Uh, but there were definitely things that I got as a kid that weren't Christian. Um, and we'll get into that too, I guess. Uh, to kind of kind of get through the major chunk of my life when I was a when I was a like middle schooler high schooler um, I actually had a friend tell me recently that my you know quote unquote logic and reason when I was in middle school I was I was like a little Ben Shapiro or whatever actually but not in a good way I actually convinced him that Christianity was stupid or that atheism was a good position or whatever. Um, you know, I would mock Christianity, um, as a, when I was kind of like, you know, becoming old enough to have intellectual opinions, uh, but like not old enough to understand what I was saying. Um, and I, I definitely was pretty hostile towards the, you know, Christian religion, not really towards Christians. Um, they were kind of my political allies, so I couldn't bash them too much. But definitely just like, oh, well, you know, those people are OK, but they're kind of stupid for believing that as kind of was kind of my attitude. And then in a one on one with somebody who wasn't a Christian, you know, I, I'd go all out on on the uh, kind of irrationality of believing in God because of evolution and and et cetera, et cetera. All the like new atheist reasons and, you know, maybe some old atheism reasons, whatever. I, I was just like I was just like, look, science explains things and uh, we don't need God to explain things. We needed God to explain things before. We don't need God to explain things now. And that was kind of my um, my position when I was like, I don't know, in middle school, maybe moving into high school. Um, but at, as I became more politically involved, because like Rush Limbaugh was on in my house all the time as a kid. Um, and if you don't know who Rush Limbaugh is. Uh, Rush Limbaugh is uh, like the biggest conservative commentator like ever, probably. Uh, He like pioneered conservative radio and he had millions of listeners. He had the biggest radio show in the nation. So massive dude, hugely influential. um, And he influenced me a lot. And uh, I was very conservative in my politics. And so that is what was kind of my, I'd say that if I had like a, if I had like a telos or a meaning or an end to my beliefs, it was political at, at root because I was, you know, I wanted what was best for mankind or something like that. I don't know. Uh, I, I wanted, you know, I wanted the, the, the sort of founding father dream of, you know, life, liberty and the pursuit of happiness and, you know, a, a, uh, a limited government and, and et cetera, et cetera, all the standard like conservative American things. Uh, and, and that's, that's kind of where I was coming from. And, as the political climate got extremely hostile, um, I had to start galvanizing my positions against other people and really thinking about things. And then 
you know, Q like 2016 election of Donald Trump, like uh, I'm, I'm fully, I'm, I'm fully in. Um, and I, you know, this is like a, a major, you know, thing uh, in my life. Um, and politics, you know, were my kind of, they were, they were the, they were the center of my, you know, philosophical, meaningful beliefs that are kind of centering around politics. Um, and I, in high school, we still got like a decent education. You know, we got to read like, you know, classics and, and, and stuff like that. And some modern writers who are pretty good. And, and so I got, I got exposure to some ideas that kind of helped push me in a direction that was um, a little more philosophical. Like I, I read transcendentalism in high school. I, I read American you know, founding father stuff. And, in, 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 you know, high school, I, I read uh, Shakespeare, I read um, some modern writers like Hemingway, or Fitzgerald, or whatever, I got the standard, um, you know, education there. And that kind of helped push me towards a philosophical, a more philosophical way, of thinking about things, because I was constantly writing, I was in like AP literature, stuff like that, I was writing, you know, uh, or honors literature, AP literature, I was writing essays about you know, what, what was an author trying to say? And so I'm reading these books and I'm getting some, some, some more insights into the world and stuff like that. But, but I'm still, I'm very much like not religious at all. I mean, it's maybe helping my, you know, political ends, you know, how I want to see the nation go or whatever, but, but that's really my, my focus. It's not political. Um, fast forward, maybe out of high school and, and towards the 2020 election, and, and all the stuff that happened between 2016 and 2020. And I am just seeing a world that is just blowing up my beliefs um, one by one. I was an enlightenment guy. I, I thought that humanity was progressing towards good constantly kind of thing. You know, if enough humans know the truth, they'll conform to the truth or they'll see the truth. And then that will that will guide them towards, you know, a prosperous nation or whatever. But but I'm just watching people willfully you know, allowing an authoritarian government to impose itself willfully allowing stupidity to just dominate their lives. And, and I'm, I'm sincerely doubting my own beliefs at this point. I'm like, okay, can I really believe this? Can I really, you know, hold on to this enlightenment ideal that like people are good and they, and they want what's good. And the vast majority of people have shown the truth. will will see the light or whatever. And, uh, and, and it was failing me rapidly. I was becoming more and more and more cynical because of what I was seeing how, how I was seeing, you know, this kind of pattern of just, you know, people willfully giving up their freedom and stuff like that. This, I, I, I saw that playing itself out and I saw people just believing stupid things. I just, I, I could show them numbers. I could show them statistics and they would just be like, no. And I'm like, what? And I was like, how is that possible? And, I, and I'm just like, are people really inherently, you know, good or do they want the truth? Like what, what, what is, you know, like what, what is a man? Like if he's like, just doesn't even can't even right? well, how can I communicate with people that can't even you know understand what I'm saying or hear what I'm saying and so my political ideology was slowly crumbling and I was I was still very political though I mean I was very invested I was like okay Donald Trump needs to win again and and then uh, you know we got to stop the you know the this you know imposition of you know authoritarianism and you know communism et cetera et cetera I mean I'm full on in you know conservative politics and I'm listening to some Ben Shapiro and I stumble across this video of this is where like the rubber hits the road. I stumble, stumble across this video of um, uh, Ben Shapiro, Dave Rubin and Jordan Peterson. Awesome video, by the way, if you've never watched that. Um, it's like a two hour like podcasty type thing on the Dave Rubin report. Uh, and they basically they cover a lot of a decent amount of subjects, but they basically for a decent chunk hit on the lack of religiosity in the nation. Um, and, and they basically all three of them concluded that this this sort of lack of religious, you know, um, uh, practice was was sort of destroying uh, American values because the American system is set up on a religious, you know, foundation. Uh, John Adams said that the Constitution require, requires a moral and religious people. Um, for it to function and if it doesn't have that it won't function anymore and i think that's like plainly obvious that that's what's happening and so that really got me thinking because because over time i had become more sympathetic to um maybe just the idea of like a deistic god or a creator of the universe because that that sort of transcendent reality that you know is all around you but you can't you know it's hard hard to ignore that, that kind of it's filtered in you know like i said i'd read some transcendentalism and i had you know read the founding fathers and i 
and I, you know, read a lot of literature and I was like, there's, there's something, there's something to all this maybe in the back of my mind, but, but, but I definitely was, was not anywhere close to like, Oh, Jesus is Lord. Like I, I, I just, I just maybe was sympathetic to the position. And so now I get this, get this idea going in my head, like, Oh, religion is necessary for a successful like country. And then, and, and then I'm like, okay, well, what else is it necessary for? Like God is necessary or something like that. And so uh, this, this was the summer of, this is when COVID hit. So COVID hit in the spring of 2020. So this is the summer of 2020. And when I, when I listened to this conversation between Dave Rubin and Jordan Peterson and Ben Shapiro, and I just started diving in um, to some arguments for God, a lot of Jordan Peterson, um, honestly, uh, because that's, that's kind of, I got hooked on him because I really liked his approach. He, he was kind of enlightenment. He was West, you know, he was, he was kind of, um, you know, he was a modernist kind of, uh, and not a postmodernist, which was, you know, uh, encouraging. He, he stood up for objective truths and things like that, because that's what I was struggling with. I mean, I always believed that there was objective good and evil, um, and, and that there were things that were right and wrong. That's why I would, I would argue politics and stuff like that so much. Cause I'm like, no, this thing is definitely right. Like in the objective sense, it's right. And Peterson was standing up for things like that. And I'm like, okay, well, I'm gonna listen to what this guy has to say, because he's standing up for, you know, uh, objective freedoms and, and objective truths and, and things of the mat of the like. And I really got into Jordan Peterson. I mean, he, he kind of was reshaping how I was thinking about things. I remember telling my dad one time I was working with him and I was, you know, telling him about like cleaning out the house or something like that, like Jordan Peterson esque. And then, you know, I was, so I was like full in on Jordan Peterson. Um, and then I stumbled across the biblical lectures and uh, those just blew me away. The, the, the biblical lectures blew me away because of how insightful Peterson was and, and how insightful the Bible is. Um, and, and I had maybe, even though I had bashed Christianity as a kid and I had said it was stupid, I had always had a reverence for the literature, I think, at least. You know, the, 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 the sort of narrative of the Bible, the Adam and Eve, you know, archetypal type story or, or, or the or the Jesus story of him dying on the cross for, for the world and, and, and think figures like King David or whatever. Like I knew about these people just because it's been instilled in so much of what we read and so much of what we, you know, consume, uh, whether it be movies or books or whatever, that, that I had a respect for the literature at least. And then I saw how insightful it was through Peterson. And it really got me thinking, you know, um, what, what's going on here. And then I'd say by the time I started my, sophomore semester in the fall i was taking a philosophy class at that time i was into peterson i was becoming con comfortable with the idea of god um that seemed to be a solution to the problem that i was uh, you know to the to the to the lack of of foundation that i had had before because before it was just like you know uh these things are right because they're right but but that's it. Like, you know, I had nothing else. I, that's, that's it. That, that's all I had. I was just like, you know, these things are true in the world, but, but that's just my opinion. I didn't really have anything backing me up. So like a God, a transcendent God, well, that, that'll work, you know, that that'll do. And, uh, and, but I wasn't Christian though. It was not, it was just like a kind of more like a deistic kind of like, okay, yeah, God. Yeah. Um, and Peterson had brought in Christianity. He's, you know, he's very Christian thinker, you know, in, in the sense that he's been in, influenced by Christian thought, but, but, he he himself at the time or at least the videos that i was watching um the videos of him that i was watching he was not at his you know kind of like point where he is where he is now where he's at this kind of like in between is he a curate christian is he not a christian i would say at that time peterson definitely wasn't a christian uh, well at least in my eyes it didn't seem like he was he wasn't acting like he was a christian in my opinion but anyway that's i don't want to get into that really um but he was he was operating from that secular psychologist but reverence for christianity type you know view and and, uh, and so I've been instilled with some of the, some of the Christian ideas, but, but mostly I was, you know, uh, had a more enlightenment deistic type conception of God now, you know, rather than like being an atheistic enlightenment type or an agnostic enlightenment type guy. Um, and, uh, I'd kind of settled on that, but what, what totally changed me there after I kind of, okay, God. God is, you know, he seems to be real in these Old Testament stories. They might have some validity or whatever. Um, I got thrown at me the case for Christ by Lee Strobel, family friend. My mom was talking to a family friend who was a Christian who was friends with her. And uh, she 
she said, oh, he might like this book then because my mom was telling her about how I, you know, was interested in God and things like that. And, and so I got this book, The Case for Christ by Lee Strobel, great book. And um, immediately when I read that book, I couldn't put it down. And immediately after I read that book, I was, something had clicked in me that was way different than before, because instead of, instead of this um, more maybe intellectual or philosophical necessity of God, now I had realized after reading that book, well, first of all, Jesus is a very legitimate character. Yeah, he's, he's a very legitimate candidate for, you know, the son of God. And he, he very may well have died on that cross it seems like a 50 50 to me um not only did i have that so not only did i have the apologetic you know like logic and reasoning to back up the belief but i had also after reading that book started to understand the gospel a little bit and underneath all of the philosophical and intellectual perusing and 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 finagling and and argumentation in my own mind there was this there was this realization slowly over time that I wasn't good enough. And all my life I had tried to be a, a upstanding. It's like I was living in hypocrisy constantly because I believed in these virtues of old. You know, I was this, I was this traditional type guy, but then I would go and do things that completely contradicted what I believed uh, on some level. And, and I didn't really have an answer for it. You know, I didn't, I didn't really know why I, the two things, you know, couldn't coexist. I just kind of did them. I was, I know I was a sinner, but I, I, I attempted to be virtuous and I, I couldn't really see why I couldn't be both. I don't know. It was, it was very, uh, it was very uh, cognitively dissonant what I, what, how I behaved because I would, I would be irresponsible and I wouldn't care, but then I would think about it later and I would care. And, and I, I just, I just couldn't get it. There was this constant, you know, um, the, the problem of the secular man is, you know, at, at, at least my type of secular man is that I, I had all these big, you know, grand ideas and virtues, but then, but then I was, I had no authority over myself except myself. And so I, I allowed myself to do terrible things. Um, and, and I, I couldn't figure it out, but, but, but after reading the case for Christ and getting a little bit of the gospel out of that book, I started to figure it out. I started to see that you know, this, this, this incapability on my part is because there's something fundamentally wrong with me. Um, and there's something fundamentally wrong about how I'm living. And so underneath all the, like I said, underneath all the philosophical and intellectual, you know, uh, uh, I say, um, I got meandering or, or thinking, uh, I had, I had this, this struggle with my own ineptitude going on underneath it all too. I, that was, I think that was really pushing me towards um, belief in God in the first place and then belief in Jesus because, because I knew that there was something that I needed. Not, not only did the world need God from a political you know, perspective or, or from you know, a, a, a meaning, right? If you want to talk about the meaning crisis, a meaning perspective, but I needed God because, because I was struggling mightily to live um, uh, consistently uh, with, 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 with my values. Um, and af after the reading the case for Christ, I dove headlong into Christian apologetics. I like, I, I forgot. I, 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 I was like, okay, we're going to go f all out. I want to know if this thing is true because this seems like it's it, you know? And, um, and I listened to William Lane Craig. I listened to Frank Turek. I listened to debates between, uh, Peterson and, and Dillahunty or Peterson and Harris, you know, I, I'm, 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 I'm trying to, I'm trying to, you know, figure out, can I believe this thing? I want to believe this thing. Can I believe it? And, um, and over time, over time, it just more and more and more and more. I, it was, it was just like CS Lewis and surprised by joy. It was like, there was nothing else I could do that there. I, I couldn't not believe that Jesus was the son of God and that he died on the cross for my sins. I, it was impossible. I, there was, there was no other, there was no other option. And it, 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 it explained everything and it was necessary. Um, it, 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 without that, without that, there was like, I, I had come to a point where I was like, if I, if this is wrong, then the world is completely meaningless. There's nothing, there's nothing except this. I, that, that's the point that I came to. But, but I knew that that really wasn't what I was going to choose either. It's like, I couldn't go back. It's like, I had seen something 
I had seen something that was that was I, I couldn't recover from. I, I had to believe this was true, and and I think it was around Christmas of uh, 2020. So um, about a year ago, I was talking to my girlfriend, and I was like, you know what? I think I'm gonna believe in Jesus. That's what I said. I was like, I, I don't see a reason not to. And she was kind of laughed and she was like, okay. I mean, she wasn't mean, but she was just kind of laughed. She's like, okay, you know, that's cool, whatever. And, uh, and after that, I really started committing myself to Christianity. I, I, I listened to a lot of Desiring God videos from John Piper where they ask questions. Cause I had all these questions. I'd never read the Bible. I, I, I don't know how to be a Christian. So I'm like, well, shoot, is this thing wrong? Is that thing wrong? It's like, what are all, what are all the things that I'm doing wrong in my life that I shouldn't be doing? You know, it was kind of my first inclination. It's like, or how should I be living as a Christian? And so I watched all these videos from like John Piper. Those really helped. I really liked those. Uh, some other ones, you know, um, still a little bit of apolog- a little bit of apologetics, but I kind of moved on to sort of like, okay, how do I, how, how do I live as a Christian? Or like, what, what, what should I believe now that I like, you know, claim to be a Christian? And, uh, and very quickly, I changed um, as a person. I apologized to my girlfriend uh, of two years. I had started dating her uh, at the end of my senior year. Uh, we went to prom together, high school sweetheart type thing. I had no, I had no intentions of dating anybody before college, but fell in love with her. Went into college, did long distance for two years, or I guess a year and a half, excluding the first part of the relationship before we were in college. But um, anyway. I had, because the political climate was so nasty at the time, like 2016 to 2020, especially leading up to the 2020 election, and I was very political, and she was a liberal, and I was a conservative, we would fight sometimes, like, and and I would get pretty nasty, and sometimes not even politically related, but we would just fight in general, you know, people do that, Um, and uh, and I would just, like, there was just stuff I wouldn't apologize for, I'd be like, you know, I didn't do anything wrong there, like, no, I'm not going to apologize, she's like, please apologize when you just move on, I'm like, no. I didn't do anything wrong. I'm not going to apologize to you. Um, you know, I'm, I'm sort of like giving up my, you know, like position of rightness or something if I apologize. Well, that's a stupid position to hold because as I told her later, I was like, there's absolutely no way I didn't sin in that interaction. So yeah, I'm sorry. Because in every single interaction where you're heated like that and you're, you're, and you're yelling, it's like you're, you're sinning in some capacity, in my opinion, for sure. I mean, there's, there's, there's times maybe when it's not like that, but I mean, I knew myself. I, I mean, I knew that, I, that it was wrong. So I apologize to her for all that. I started being much more relaxed with, with things sweeter, nicer, gentler. You know, I, I, I would, I would, if we, if something came up, I would start to kind of, you know, say, Oh wait, no, let's not get into this. I, I shouldn't have said that or whatever. I was just, I was being a way better because this was right after the 2020 election. And we, we fought like cats and dogs at the 2020 election. Like that was, that was bad. And, and I, and so our relationship was kind of shaky, but then around Christmas time, I, you know, had these Christian, uh, this kind of Christian change in my life. And, you know, and, and I had started adopting these moral principles. And so I became a lot better man in that, in that time frame. And she really liked that. I mean, she was, she was like all in and she's like, you know, I, I even told her that like, oh, I shouldn't make jokes like that. Or those jokes aren't. And, and she would, cause she used to criticize me for having like dark humor or like mean humor or whatever. And I'd be like, yeah, you're right. I really shouldn't say things like that. And so she was really happy that I was like, kind of, you know, like agreeing with her on stuff, apologizing, be a better person. I mean, who wouldn't be right. But then she wasn't really happy when I kept going. I mean, the more and more I kept going into Christianity, the more and more I realized like, oh, I really can't be with a girl like that as a Christian, can I? And I, and I, and I always, it was like, it's like, I looked back on my life and every single time I did something sinful that that was like memorable, it's like, I always kind of knew, it's like, I always kind of knew it was wrong. There's a certain feeling you get. I I don't know. I can't really describe it. I mean, maybe you just know what I'm talking about, but there's, it's kind of like this, like, I don't know, this sort of, this sort of like, you know, what you're doing is wrong, but you don't care. Or it's like, you can tell what you're doing is kind of evil or devious or bad, but it's like, I kind of like it like that. I don't know. That's pretty, you know, that's pretty hardcore, but that's really how I view like a lot of the stuff that I used to do. It's like, you know, because of my sin nature, I had an affinity for sinful things that were pretty evil and I would do them anyway and I would enjoy it. But I would, I would know that they were evil kind of when I did it, but I I didn't really get it because I'm like, well, I like it. So how can it be evil? Right. I mean, that's how self-centered sinners think, but, but I kind of knew, and I kind of knew like looking back, like, yeah, all those times that I, you know, did sexual stuff with my girlfriend, it's like, 
yeah, there's something good in there. Like, like sex is good. Like that's not necessarily bad, but, but I shouldn't have been doing it in that way at that time, not being married. You know, I kind of get it. It was all clicking for me. And so I, I went to her and I was like, Hey, I can't do that anymore. And she was like, okay, well, I'll have to think about that for a while. Like I, that's, that's like news to me. And I'm like, fair enough. And a couple of weeks later, she came back to me and she was like, I can't do that either. It's like, ah, well, I can't do, I can't, you can't do that. Like, you know, it's either, it's either we're going to keep, you know, the relationship the way it is in that sense, or, you know, we're going to have to, I, I don't think I can, I can live like that. And so I gave it my all. I like, I really loved her. I've been with her for a long time. I and mean, I, I was going to propose to her when I graduated. I mean, I, I, she's a really good, you know, human being in the relative sense. Yeah. I know I'm a Calvinist, but I mean, human beings can be relatively better than other human beings. And, and she, she really was, you know, like a pretty civically righteous person, in my opinion, um, to use some Calvinist language there. Uh, and, and I, I mean, I always thought she was better than me. I, I always thought that I, mean, I always thought she's more virtuous than me. She's better than me. She's nicer than me, kinder than me. I always thought that like, she makes me better kind of thing. But, um, so, so I tried hard to, to convince her to, to, to stay. I mean, I gave, I gave a, what I consider to be a pretty beautiful explanation of what marriage is and what sex and marriage is and why you should wait. Um, and, uh, and I, you know, I, 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 I said, I, I said to her, I was like, so, so do you really value the sex more than our relationship? Right. Because I mean, we can, we can stay together and we don't have to do that. And, and then we can just, it's literally just going to be us. It's like our personalities are, our, our, you know, and our, you know, love for one another. It's, it's not going to be, you know, sort of, there's no blinding of sex going on. And she, she kind of took that in a way that surprised me. And she was like, you know, you think all these things we did were bad. And I'm like, well, no, not exactly. It's like in the right context, they would have been good, but they were bad in the wrong context. Like, so we shouldn't be doing that. And she's like, I just can't see it like that. Like, like that was love. And I'm like, well, yes and no, you know, I was, I was trying my best. I'm like, yes and no. Um, and, uh, and, and I'm like, if we don't break up, if we were to marry, then well, yeah, it's like we stayed together, but imagine we have all, we do all these things and we break up. I'm like, that's not supposed to happen. You know, like, I'm not supposed to join together with you like that and then break apart from you like that. That's not natural. And, and I mean, she couldn't see it. You know, she was like, I, I can't, I just can't see the things that we did as bad. And then like, I just, I want to keep doing them. And if you're not going to keep doing them, like we can't stay together basically. And I'm like, at this point, I was seriously like, okay, do I really want to do this? Do I really want to go through with this? Because I was seriously considering backing out. I mean, I, I was like, I, I could give this all up and keep her. I mean, I, I could just kind of go back and, and, and kind of keep my moral changes, but don't keep the Jesus part or whatever. And, and I could stay with her. And I was seriously, seriously, seriously considering it. Like I, I really did consider it. But at the end of the day, I was like, no, I can't because there's nothing else I can. I, I can't not believe what I believe. It's too obvious. It's too plain. It's like, I, this is it. This, if I give up this, I give up everything. And so that to me was the point. Well, I said that I kind of converted in, in around Christmas time, but this was around February that this happened of 2021. And this was when I really think that I was tested. Like, are you a Christian or not? This, this was it. This was my test from God saying, okay, do you really want to commit to me or not? You know, you have to choose her or me. And so I was romantic. I'm still romantic. Everybody knows I'm romantic. If you've ever read anything that I read or I, I type in BOM chat. And, um, and so this was, this was every, this is what I love most. This, this was the thing that I love. She was the thing that I loved most in life. Really? Probably. I don't know. Maybe my own life more. Cause I'm self-centered, narcissistic, whatever, you know, but like, man, I, 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 I loved her more than anything, but I was like, Nope, not going to do it. Can't do that. So she said that I had to do it. She couldn't break up with me. She's like, I can't do that. You have to do it. And I'm like, oh God. So it really was in my, it really was in my court. The ball was in my court. I had to make the decision. And so I did. And it was really sad. And, um, and that was, but that after that, I was like, okay, I just gave up my girlfriend for, for God. I'm going to go all in now. I'm like, I, I'm I, now, now, now this is like full commitment. So then I started going to church. I actually very quickly joined BOM after that because I was lonely and sad. And I had watched a couple of Paul Vanderclay videos. I knew he had like a, a discord and I was like, oh, this should be a good way to pass the time. Um, 
And, but I dove into Christianity and I, and I really started digging into like theology and, and what I, how I should behave and how I should act and, and, and what worship should be like. And, and just all these different things. And I, I like, I started eating it up. I mean, I was watching Christian videos constantly. I was, I was reading stuff constantly. Um, and, uh, and we can keep going, but this is when the, this is when the Calvinism starts to come in is, is after this. And so I don't know if we want to pause and reflect on what my, on my story or whatever, but, but at that, I mean, I was definitely a Christian, but like, but I wasn't a Calvinist. Um, and, and after that was really, I have some, I pulled up some quotes from myself and discord after that around like February, March of what things, some things I said about Calvinism, which are pretty funny, which I'll, what I want to read a little later, but um, like that, that was, that's my conversion story. That's, that's, that's what I think is my conversion story. And then I have a Calvinism conversion story, like a Calvinism, you know, uh, you know, kind of, you know, epiphany that, that came a little later, but, but that was my conversion to Christianity. I love it. Thank you for sharing. And I think what is the really cool point about your story is that it seems like you were all in um, from the beginning even not knowing what you believed, but you did everything wholeheartedly. And then when you decided to follow Jesus, it was wholehearted in that he gave you the choice to choose between the girlfriend or him. And I love how she even gave you that choice too, that that was your choice. You decided that. And that I just think is so cool. Well done. Thank you. Thank yeah, you honestly, much. it's really admirable. Well, I appreciate that. I would, I would, I would give all the credit to God, and I will, because well, yeah. I'm a Calvinist. Calvinist. But, but, <laughs> but I don't know. It's hard to take. I, I don't want to not take praise. You know, I, I really appreciate like what both of you guys said. Um, you know, like I think C.S. Lewis said, like when it comes to myself. I'm a Calvinist, or when it comes to other people, um, oh, I'm an Arminian. Because because he was like about myself. Oh yeah, no, I didn't do anything. That's all of God. But then others, you know, oh yeah, they're they're good people. Like they they deserve it. And uh, that, well, that's kind of muddled and inconsistent. But you can see what he's trying to say. Um, you know, we 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 like to praise others. You know, and that's good because we should. And I really appreciate that. But then when I'm like, I think to myself, I'm like, oh, that was all of God. You know, and and uh, and it's just kind of it's kind of funny. I mean, he works through means, and that includes, you know, decisions and personality and all of that. Circumstances. So, Caitlin, you want to go next, or shall I? <laughs> oh, I thought we were going to hear the Calvinism conversion story. Oh, yeah, we could. Yeah, if we can hear that too. Like, I, I'm in no rush. Any, any which way. Well, I don't know. Maybe. Maybe we should, yeah, I think maybe we should get everybody else. And because I'm, I'm, I'm pretty sure that once we get into Calvinism, we won't get out of it. Yeah, probably. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. Fair point. Anamik, you want to go first? Sure. So as the name might suggest, I do, uh, I do come from a Dutch background. Um, my mother grew up in the Netherlands. My dad's parents are both Dutch. I, I was born in Canada. And uh, the Netherlands, well, historically, for the past couple hundred years, up until the 50s or so, it was a very uh, Calvinistic country, right? So uh, there was a lot of that religious background. And so when my grandparents uh, immigrated to Canada here, they were Calvinist. The, a lot of the Dutch immigrants started Calvinist churches. There are scads of reformed churches around here. They just litter the place. Um, my mom's story is a bit different because by the time she was born, the Netherlands was pretty secular and it continued to secularize. But uh, she was still a Christian. And then when my parents met, uh, my dad was at the time in a, in a, well, I don't know. Let me think. So my grandfather, my grandparents were in um, the Christian Reformed Church, which you may be familiar with through uh, Paul Vanderclay. 
but there was a split in the Christian Reformed Church in mid to late 90s um, over the issue of women in office. And as a result, the United Reformed denomination uh, was was started and uh, my grand, uh, my parents met each other at about that time. So I'm not sure if they were in the CRC or the URC yet, but regardless, my mom kind of came to the dark side, shall we say. And uh, yeah, so I was born within sort of, we call it the Dutch ghetto, honestly. There are probably a couple thousand of us around here. Uh, I'm in Southern Ontario, uh, like uh, rural Niagara and, yeah, there are lots and lots of people around here. So when I, I have one older brother and then four younger siblings and my parents decided when my brother was born that they were going to uh, homeschool us. So I was, you know, very sheltered. So yeah, I grew up within a very um, Christian environment. My, uh, we went to church twice every Sunday because we do the morning and evening thing within the within the ghetto here, and uh, yeah, uh, homeschooled. We had a lot of Bible work to do for our you know elementary and high school stuff. Um, all of my friends, well, I didn't have many friends. I'm not a very sociable person to be honest. But um, you know, it was either hanging out with my cousins or. Um, you know, some other kids from church or from our homeschool group. So honestly, the only non-reformed kid that I knew was my neighbor girl who was a, who was a nominal Catholic. But um, yeah, so very sheltered. Um, when I was about mm, 10, 11, the, uh, okay, part of the context here is that I was born and raised in the city for a couple of years. And then we moved out of the city into rural area. And the church we were going to was still in the city. Um, that church split and kind of made a plant, a church plant closer to here. So we were there for a while. Um, there, there, were, there were some issues. The thing with being in a, in a tight community where everyone knows everybody is that you know, certain schisms, clans, divisions get riled up and uh, Dutch people are notoriously disagreeable. Uh, so yeah, there, there are always conflicts to deal with. But then uh, I graduated high school early. I was uh, just before I turned 17, I graduated. And then after high school, I did a one-year program in uh, church history, theology, philosophy, broader um, history. I did that through a Presbyterian church um, from, from a uh, conservative Presbyterian denomination. And then after that, I, um, I went to university, but kind of in the meantime, my parents themselves were sort of... Um, going towards Presbyterianism. It helps that my father always kind of had those inclinations. Um, so yeah, over the years, you know, following high school graduation and then early university, my family and I transitioned into uh, Presbyterianism, specifically we're in the um, Orthodox Presbyterian Church, the OPC. And um, yeah, I don't, I don't really have a um, dramatic conversion story or anything. Uh, about when I was about 12, 13, it sort of became, you know, more real to me. Uh, you know, someone who was born and raised Christian and then comes into it can probably understand what I mean when I say that it becomes more real to you. Uh, so I did, um, we call it profession of faith around here when I was 13, 14, which is considered very early, but um, 
yeah, that's about it. That's that's the story. Um, I I, I did uh, stumble upon Jordan Peterson. What when I was graduating high school, maybe when I was away for school, and I joined Bridges of Meaning shortly after it started. So I've been around for probably two years now. But yeah, that's that's kind of the rundown. I mean there isn't much to elaborate on let's be honest uh nothing dramatic so yeah that's cool i was gonna ask how you ended up on the discord well no well, what happened is I, I i was watching uh jordan peterson videos and then uh paul vanderclay popped up in the in the recommended bar or whatever but the the thing is you know having some history with the uh, Christian Reformed Church and then seeing it say CRC pastor I was like oh man no way <laughs> great bait for um, someone like me so that's kind of how I got sucked in yeah, yeah that's about it Colton did you have anything you wanted to say well just even though that uh, your story might not be as dramatic as mine. Um, I, I still appreciate, you know, background and I'm sure everyone else does as well. And I wanted to add that I didn't say this, but the reason I, or how I got to become aware of Paul Vanderclay and his discord was I listened to a Matt Dillahunty, Jordan Peterson debate, and it left me with like a very sour taste in my mouth. And I was like, I, I want, I want to understood what, understand what happened there because like, I just didn't like the way the debate went. And I found this video of Paul Vanderclay analyzing uh, the Dillahunty Peterson debate. And I was like, oh, this is interesting. And I don't know what it said. And I, I don't even know. I, I didn't know he was a Christian. I just saw I just saw the like uh, I just saw the title and the title like intrigued me because I think it was, you know, kind of like uh, confirming my biases or something. I don't know. Anyway, I clicked on the video and I listened to Paul break down the debate. And he explained that, like, basically, Dylan Hunting and Peterson were operating in totally different frames. And that's why the debate sucked so much ass. Sorry for the language. But, um, but, but basically, that was why. And it was like, it was like Dylan Hunty was arguing like up here, and Peterson was way down here. And they just weren't even on the same like playing field. And then I figured out at the end of the video or something that he was a, you know, Christian pastor. I'm like, oh, that's cool. Like, and, and, uh, cause at this point I was more like heavily leaning towards Christianity. I'm like, oh, that's reassuring. Um, and I watched a couple of those videos, but I just kind of knew that he existed and I knew the discord existed. And then I, I ended up joining, uh, after my girlfriend and I broke up because I was sad and lonely, but yeah, that, that's how I got into discord. Yeah. I guess that didn't work for now. <laughs> Um, you're up okay so I was born and raised Christian um like I said earlier I guess it would be considered Baptist from a lot of people who have told me what they think about the way I grew up um uh, but they would have considered themselves non-denominational so that was kind of confusing to me but anyway I I can't really remember a time that I didn't love God and want to know him. Um, and I was very involved in the church that I grew up in. And my family would host Bible studies every week. And when my dad and mom would go to the leadership training for those, I remember all the kids would have to sit up in this loft while the grownups were downstairs meeting and everything. And it was usually only me and my sister and my sister would always bring a book to read. And I would always bring my Bible and a notebook because I wanted to hear what the grownups were talking about because they were talking about God. And I would sit as close as I could to the railing without being seen. And I was totally following along with everything that they were saying because I found in myself this hunger to know God. And that only ever increased as I got older that I almost felt like there was something missing like 
there's more of God. I know it. And I don't know what it is, but I won't stop until I find it. And um, I did kind of, I wouldn't necessarily consider it like a falling away, but just made some poor choices and um, had stopped going to church for a time, though I never walked away from the faith, but was just making poor choices. And during that time, I um, met some people who invited me to their church, which was charismatic in comparison to the church I grew up in, a bit of a culture shock, to be honest, but um, I remember going to this church thinking, wow, these people are super happy, and it seems genuine, not that the people at the church I grew up in were not genuinely happy, but it seemed different at this other church and I couldn't quite put my finger on it but I liked it and they um I guess two of the most important things that stood out to me were um during worship they they would have like a lot of instrumental time and people would sing out in their own words Whereas the church I grew up in was like, you only sing two fast songs and two slow songs and you sing it from beginning to end. And then you go right into prayer announcements, teaching, and everybody's checking their watch for when they can go home. And it kind of seemed like what I would call weekend Christians, if you know what I mean. <laughs> and this other church that I had started going to, this charismatic church seemed like everybody wanted to talk about God even all throughout the week and they wanted to study the word and really know him and so in worship it was quite a different experience for me in that it was actually really uncomfortable for me like I was looking around going oh my gosh these people are talking to God as if they know him and as if they're friends or something. And can somebody just tell me what to say? Cause I don't know what to say to God. <laughs> like, I'm much more comfortable just reading the words off the screen. So that was a point of curiosity for me of like, what do they know about God that I don't? And anyway, one of the things that was even more, um, curious to me than that was this church talked about the Holy Spirit and the church I grew up in they wouldn't like skip over it if it was in a scripture verse that they were reading but there was very little talk of the Holy Spirit and it was more so just like the Holy Spirit is kind of like your conscience he convicts you of everything bad that you've ever done and this other church that I started going to, um, they, I think they still believe like convicting of sin, but there was a deeper level to it that was like, it's not only that, but he reveals the father and he reminds you the things that Jesus said, and he can help you understand yourself. <laughs> And he can help you understand, I mean, pretty much anything. So that was all new to me. And it was kind of like eye-opening thinking, man, how come nobody ever told me about this? Like, I don't really know what I thought Christianity was all about before then. Um, and I guess I'm still kind of searching that out, which is maybe a little bit embarrassing to say since I grew up in the church, I should know what it's all about, but uh, this is part of why I ended up on the Discord, which I'll get to later, but I was going to this church, this other church, the charismatic one, and my friends there had done um, a school of worship down in California, and they found a school of ministry there and my friend was telling me all about it. And I thought, oh man, we should go. 
And she was like, yeah, let's think about it, pray about it, then we'll make a decision. And I knew in my heart, I'm like, I'm going to this school because that sounds like the more of God that I've been searching for. And so long story short, we all packed up and moved down and the school was even more of a culture shock than this charismatic group that I had started going to. Um, and I think that was probably one of the most significant changes in my relationship with the Lord of my whole life at, up until that point, I guess. Um, but after three years at the school and being out of the school environment where it's like there's this momentum of faith and excitement and being out of the school, you kind of find out what you're made of and what God has established in you. And I felt like I grew even more being out of the school than I did in the school in just pursuing God all on my own without needing the momentum of other people pursuing him too. Does that make sense? Um, then uh, I started um, attending a Bible study for about maybe two years, I think. And I think I, I had come in on like the tail end of, they were finishing up the gospel of John, I think. And then the next book that we started was the book of Romans. And I, uh, I, sorry, I need to give a little bit more backstory. So the church that I grew up in, um, they were pretty against any kind of searching out other things. Like they really didn't want you to ask questions um, because I, I guess they kind of had this underlying teaching that their way was the correct way and that anybody who went to a different church like questioned their salvation basically and so I I was very curious for as long as I can remember but kind of felt like it was wrong to um, search things out and so I I guess that could be considered very sheltered, although it was almost self-imposed. And so then fast forward to this Bible study that I was attending, um, they were suggesting reading commentaries and I had like this huge reaction within myself of like, no, I can't read a commentary. Like what if they're wrong that I'm gonna be led astray? <laughs> and so I, finally got over myself and read a commentary and it was amazing and it helped so much. And then even just having the discussion with people in the Bible study of like, we, sometimes we wouldn't even get through a whole chapter and we met once a week and would plan to do like a whole chapter a week. And sometimes we wouldn't even get that far because the discussion was so deep and that kind of transformed the way I read the word. And then we did Revelation next, which was such a great experience because I kind of avoided Revelation most of my life <laughs> um, because it, it seemed like it was so hard to understand and I didn't really have the tools to search things out, kind of like I was talking before. And so one of the things in both of those books is a lot of mention of Israel. And in the church I grew up in, and then that next charismatic church, and even the charismatic school that I went to, they all kind of um, read the Bible through the lens of anytime Israel is mentioned, it's talking about Christians. And 
then in this Bible study that I was going to, they were kind of saying, actually, when the Bible mentions Israel, they're talking about Israel, like God's people. And yes, Christians are grafted into that body. But anyway, um, so that was kind of what got me thinking of like, wow, I've never really questioned anything that I've believed until now. I just took what was handed to me and kind of had this mindset of don't question it because people who are teaching, they're right and they know what they're talking about. And, but I still had a lot of curiosity. And so I guess that's kind of where I've ended up now is kind of searching out what I believe and why I believe what I believe. Not that I'm questioning my faith by any stretch of the imagination. I'm more so um, actually, I don't even know how to describe that. Um, does that make sense, you guys? Yeah, I, you want to um, you believe you believe that Jesus is Lord and he died on the cross for your sins. You want to know how to accurately be a Christian if that makes sense, or, or, or maybe that's too like propositional. I don't know. Uh, uh, you want to know how to live that out, like the best way possible. So that's why you want to question, questioning what you believe, because maybe perhaps, you know, there is a better way to understand this or that, or there's a better way for me to be in the body of Christ or whatever, but you still want to be in the body of Christ. You still, you're very much in, you just want to know how Absolutely. to do it correctly. Yeah. Yes. yes. Doing it correctly, I think is kind of what I'm, out right now <laughs> I kind of wrapped up my story <laughs> and that's how I ended up at discord to um one of the guys in bible study you guys might know him, Nick goes by free Rillian. Mm -hmm. um he oh, I know Nick. yeah <laughs> yeah he invited me to discord because of some of the questions i was asking him personally and, and then he told me yeah there's uh, some uh, i think at the time i was asking some questions about judaism and just Jude jewish history and he said that he would ask his jewish acquaintances on this discord and let me know and then i had even more questions <laughs> and so he ended up just inviting me so i could ask them myself and so here I am. <laughs> and then this discussion really started because uh, you asked me about Romans, right? Yes. Yeah. I got asked about Romans. And I said that I'd give you an answer. And it took a while. But here we are. <laughs> here we are. We're there. Um, thanks for sharing. Uh, it's clear that you, uh, you know, you have a deep love for God. You know, clearly it's been there the whole time. You know, I think mm -hmm. I see that pervasive that, that that narrative is pervasive throughout your story and you, know, you just want to know you know how do i how do i know god which by the way knowing god by j.i packer it's a great book i'm reading it right now that, that honestly might be of interest to you but anyway we can get into that j.i mm -hmm. packer was a anglican but he was like reformed in his soteriology or soteriology his his theology of salvation was reformed but uh, he was an anglican so anyway Well, back to your Calvinist conversion story. Sure. Okay. So, yeah, with uh, we all have our backgrounds now. We all know where we're coming from a little bit more. Um, my background is, you know, American Midwest kid, traditional American values, you know, agnostic atheist, gone Christian, sold out for Jesus, kind of. Um, I stumble from time to time. Uh, but uh, anyway, hopefully that helps everyone in the discussion, everyone who listens in to this. Um, my, I'm going to start by reading some of the things that I said in the Discord a few days after joining. Literally, I think I joined like on the 11th or 12th or 13th of February. And some of these things are from like the 17th of February, uh, 2021. 
All right. This one I think is the best. It's a big long quote. My it's a big long quote about why I reject Calvinism. This is great. I'll read it. My largest rejection of Calvin. This is on 2 17 2021. My largest rejection of Calvinism as a whole is extra biblical in nature, though I think there are Arminian passages. I don't think humanity doesn't have free will. It just doesn't fit in my estimation. It makes Adam and Eve a strange story and the fall of Satan strange as well. Also, people such as Noah and Abraham were godly before Christ doesn't mean they were saved, uh, but they chose to walk with God. They didn't reject him. God, in my view, is so sovereign that he could create free screen free creatures and still have sovereignty and enact his will. And if you tell somebody it wasn't their choice to love God, I think you're going to turn a lot of heads. Arminians explain this by saying after the death of Christ, all can be saved because God extends his grace to all humans. And he did because he gave his only son for us all. So we could hear the word and choose whether or not to believe it. He worked so hard to make us love him. Genuinely, he doesn't have to force us to love him. Oh my God. I want to throw up. I want to throw up. That's the standard, that's the standard um, uh, line of, 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 you know, free will, Calvinism is BS, you know, garbage that I hear all the time, and I just want to throw up. I'm like, I can't believe that I said that. I can't believe that I said that. Calvinism is not necessarily easy, but it's so crazy how far that I've come. I would, I, if someone put that, like, like Blocky could say that, I don't know if you guys are familiar with him, but Blocky could say that. And, uh, and, and I would just tear him to shreds. He could say the same thing I just said. I'd tear him to shreds. Um, there's a couple other funny ones that are a little shorter um, uh, that, that I put in here. Uh, uh, I'd agree. God chose me long ago. I, I was responding to something. I said, I'd agree. God chose me long ago. It was my choice whether or not to accept. No, that's false. But I said it anyway. Um, uh if I walk with God, he walks with me. If I choose not to walk with God, he abandons me to ruin as Romans describes. That's kind of true, but like it was in, it was still in this vein. Uh, it, I think Calvinism is irrelevant insofar that it makes you debate whether you should make meaningful choices. And that's just silly. God knows who will be saved. Doesn't mean you could play a part in saving more people. Uh, I don't know what I meant by that, but uh, own, own your actions, make good choices, store up Trevor treasures in heaven. There's not, that's not all terribly bad, but you can see that I am straw manning. If you know anything about Calvinism. <laughs> Um, I am strawmanning the hell out of Calvinism in all those statements because I'm acting as if people in Calvinism don't make choices. I'm acting as if people in Calvinism or in, you know, who believe in Calvinism believe that, uh, you know, God is this puppeteering God who controls all of our actions. And we don't actually make free will decisions in the sense that our wills are bound by God uh, or he's controlling our wills or whatever. We're not the ones actually making moral uh, choices. God is making our moral choices for us. Thus, thus God is responsible and we are not responsible, et cetera, et cetera. This was just pervasive in what I, you know, in, in my construction of Calvinism uh, or my, my straw man construction of Calvinism. And uh, about like, I think a month and a half, two months later, uh, I had completely reversed my position. And so I just think it's funny that when I came into the discord, that's what I was saying. And now if someone said that to me in the discord, I would rip them apart, you know, lovingly, but I'd rip them apart because it's false. It's a straw man. And I feel like that is most people's straw man of Calvinism. Um, I said those things uh, at that time because and that's what I believed Calvinism to be, because that's what a lot of people say Calvinism is. You know, I had listened to like Leighton Flowers, who's an absolute clown. OK, no offense to Leighton Flowers. Like, I, I hope that he's saved. I hope that he's, you know a believer, but his construction of Calvinism is a joke. And, and the things that he says about Calvinism are a joke. Um, and it's, it's, he says he was a Calvinist at one point in time. And I just can't believe that. And so I'm giving the same sort of line of argumentation there that someone like Leighton Flowers would give um, maybe a little bit better than Leighton Flowers. Cause anyway, sorry, I don't like Leighton Flowers, um, at least his views on soteriology. Uh, and uh, you know, I was into Craig, I was into Turek. Right. And both of them are Molinists. So those were like some of the apologists that helped me out a lot coming into the faith. And I still appreciate that. I mean, not, it's not like everything they said is false. It's not even like the free will arguments or like God created creatures who can love him and things like that. It's not like those are even bad. It's just they're not holistic. It's not the whole story, in my opinion. Um, it's, there's, there's something more going on there. And so um, 
I kind of quickly moved into like a Molinist position because I was reading the scriptures and saw that God's sovereignty was just all over the place. Like it was unavoidably true that God was sovereign and that he had a lot of authority and that he knew everything. Um, and so open theism for me was almost immediately out the window. And uh, I hope it, it should be for everyone too, but I know it's not. So maybe this conversation will help, but it should be because God, God does know what's going on at all times. And he doesn't limit his own knowledge. In my opinion, that's what the Bible clearly says. So I, I got rid of like any type of open theism, like immediately I had moved into like, you know, maybe more traditional Arminianism, but honestly let like leaned Molinist because I didn't like the Arminian uh, conception of uh, what's it called when the, when the will like, or, or when, when everyone's wills are like freed by the death of Jesus, it's called prevenient grace. Prevenient grace is our, is the Arminian theolo theological position that says uh, when Christ died, um, and you can apply this retroactively or whatever, but basically God has provided, or maybe not when Christ, I don't know. God has provided prevenient grace to everybody so that they can believe in Jesus because they are, because they're sinners. So they weren't Pelagians. The Armenians aren't Pelagians. Uh, they're like semi-Pelagian maybe. Uh, they, 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 they say that, okay, everyone's a sinner. They can't choose God. So what happens is God provides prevenient grace to all so that they can choose. Um, and that's respectable because they're at least acknowledging some things in the scripture that like, okay, man is sinful and doesn't like God. And so God needs to do something about that. And that helps explain like, you know, passages, at least for the Arminian that, you know, God, you know, God has called everyone first and then et cetera, et cetera, you know? Um, so that that's a decent construction, but I didn't really like prevenient grace. It seemed kind of arbitrary. Like there's no mention of it in my opinion, in the Bible uh, really, you know, clearly at all. And it seemed kind of arbitrary and it didn't really seem to encapsulate the whole picture. So I kind of, move towards Molinism. Um, but I didn't like that either because, I mean, I really respected Craig and Turek and, and some, some other apologists who were more like that, but mostly those two. But to me, Molinism seemed also arbitrary because God was constructing the best world from a set of possible worlds that saved the most people. And I just didn't think the Bible suggested that at all. I actually, a lot of times the Bible suggests that God, you know, like, like Jesus says that he's happy or it pleases uh, him and, and God that, that, that he hides the truth from the wise. So you know, those who would consider themselves wise. And so that doesn't sound like God is intentionally trying to save as many people as possible. And he's sort of struggling against our will or something like that, our free wills or whatever. Um, that just, just doesn't seem, seem very, the, the Molinist God seemed far more mechanistic to me uh, than, than what the Bible was putting forth, uh, this sort of utilitarian idea of God, that God constructs a world from the set of all possible worlds, uh, logical, logically possible worlds that, that uh, you know, where the most people are saved. It's like, well, why does the most people, I mean, you, one may think that saving the most amount of people might glorify God the most, but where does the Bible say that? And, and, and why does that necessarily have to be the case? It's sort of like you're turning God into the you're turning God into like the trolley car problem. And you're saying the right pick is the hundred people. Well, is that really true? It's like, I, I, I can't, I mean, I can't say that. Like, what if it is more valuable to save the one person? What if the one person is your daughter and the hundred people you don't know? I'm just saying there's the trolley car problem is a problem because it's a problem. And so Molinism, Molinism is basically the most people that are saved. Well, that's the best outcome, but I don't think that's necessarily true. Um, and I, I really don't think it's true at all, actually. Um, so I flirted there, but really what I found myself doing is like, okay, we have free will, but like God is sovereign. And I just really don't want to reconcile the two. That's really where I found myself because I was like, we make choices. We're responsible, but, but at the same time, God is sovereign. So I, I mean, I just, it's just a mystery. I kind of played the mystery card for a while. I was like a mystery card. Like I, I don't have to answer this question, but the problem was I really liked John MacArthur. I really liked John Piper. I hadn't gotten into RC sprawl yet, but once I did, I really liked him. Um, I, uh, I didn't like James White at first, but then the more I listened to him, I realized he's a lot smarter than what Leighton Flowers, at least his argumentation was better. Um, and so I realized that I liked all these reformed pastors. And I mean, they gave great sermons. I mean, John MacArthur gives great sermons. I don't care what you think about his soteriology. He doesn't talk about Calvinism all the time. His sermons are awesome. You know, you can pick an awesome uh, uh, MacArthur sermon. Um, and, uh, you know, John Piper, I know some people don't like his style, but the guy is clearly sold out for Jesus, in my opinion. And he's got a lot of, you know, good answers to simple questions. And, uh, and, I, and he's, he's a lot more intelligent, I think, than some people give him credit for. But 
but these, I mean, these guys were just smart. I mean, and they were, and they were, they were also conservative Christians. I mean, I found Calvinism to be like, at least these, these conservative Calvinist pastors to be like, you know, they were, they were with it. Uh, they, they were, they were, they believed in a powerful sovereign God who, who, you know, uh, it, it, was, it was just the God of the Bible. I was just, I was just the God that they were presenting was the God of the Bible to me far more than some of these other kind of more philosophical conceptions of, of, of God that were coming from, you know, an Arminian or a Molinist or whatever. And uh, I explored Lutheranism for like half a second until I realized that single predestination made zero sense. No offense, Lutherans. It's just my opinion. Um, but uh, <laughs> I was like, yeah, no, that's cute. But you just need to go a little bit farther in my opinion. So I was kind of like, okay, well, it's either, it's either, you know, I was like, God is sovereign. There's free will, I think. Uh, but I, I don't know. Like, I like, I like all these Calvinist pastors and I think they have these great sermons and it's just like, I don't agree with them, but, but why it's like, what's holding me back? You know, it's like, I, I don't, I don't get it. And, uh, and so it was either like, okay, we, we have the libertarian free will or whatever, or we, or we have the compatibilist Calvinist type uh, free will. And I really couldn't get it until I listened to a video by R.C. Sprawl, where he explained free will. And that's when he gave me Jonathan Edwards' conception of free will, which is, in my opinion, the greatest conception of free will that exists on the planet. Greatest treatise ever written on, on, on free will, Jonathan Edwards. Um, and, and, how, and how libertarian free will is kind of insane, because if, if we really could choose anything at any given moment, like we would turn left when we wanted to turn right, or like, or or we could just like we could just act outside of our accorded or all of the previous actions that have like culminated in our current position. We could, we would just act without even thinking about any of those things, and that's what true libertarian freedom is. Is like none of the previous causes affect the outcome, whereas whereas that's the opposite is true in a compatibilist free will system where you, you can actually make decisions based upon what you've received. So like so. So in a compatibilist free will system, I will choose what I desire most. I mean, at least according to John Edward, Jonathan Edwards. And, 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 I, and if I couldn't choose what I desired most, my will would not be free. And in the libertarian sense, if I can choose anything at any time, I'm not necessarily choosing what I desire most. And then my will is not free because I'm not choosing what I desire most. And that, that is true freedom is being able to choose what you want. Um, libertarian freedom is being able to choose anything, not what you want. So I don't think that's free will. And I think that this is like the big problem with, with, kind of libertarian free will and and that hooked me i was like okay that problem is solved i can have free will and be a calvinist i was like that's crazy i had never known that that to, that to be the case but if you read calvin you read or you listen to sprawl you read sprawl you listen to john piper you listen to john MacArthur. none of them believe that we don't have moral agency and we make choices they might be hesitant to use the words free will because it has this libertarian connotation but like the vast majority of calvinists uh, bv warfield you know old princeton type calvinists J.I. Packer, whatever, go back, you know, Luther wasn't a Calvinist, but he was very much like in the reformed, you know, sphere. And it's like all these people believed that we made choices. They thought they were responsible. Right? None of them believe that we are like literally the only people who believe that that uh, our wills are just totally in the control of God or, or whatever. Or we 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 just nothing we do matters is, is hyper Calvinism. And that's that's heresy. That's not Calvinism. It's hyper Calvinism. And so I realized that Calvinism includes choices. And I was like, oh, well, that's a big deal. And then you can, you, and Calvinism includes free will in the compatibilistic sense, because the libertarian sense, like I said, in my opinion is stupid, but, uh, but I'm not trying to offend anybody either. It's just, you know, I'm articulating my opinion here. Um, and, and so, okay, that's a big problem solved. But also I was realizing that biblically um, there, there was another problem. I, 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 the Bible clearly taught, like in, in my opinion, in, in passages like John or from, from John or in Paul, that we have a sin nature and, and, and we can't choose God without God. And, 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 you know, just name all the big passages from John, name the, 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 you know, I have my sheep and I will keep my sheep, you know, God called, called to you first, you know, um, all, all the big passages from John, uh, you know, the, the big passages from Paul talking about our works, you know, none, not, not one is righteous. Um, you know, our works are like filthy rags. Uh, you know, the, I'm just forgetting the big one. Um, there's another one that, that I forgot. I think it's in Ephesians that I, that I missed. Anyway, there's all over the place. And, and then you have Paul and Romans talking about those who were, those who were predestined 
uh, were called and those who were called were justified and those who were justified were glorified. And, and, and it's, it's, there's this clear pattern of people being called out to God. And, you know, Jesus himself says the flesh profits, nothing people who believe or believe because of the spirit is essentially what Jesus says. I'm paraphrasing there, but, but the flesh profits, nothing. You must be born again to see the kingdom of God. Well, how can you choose the kingdom of God if you can't see it? And, and, and then there's another side to this that isn't as sinister as most people like to make it out. And that's that, how could anyone see the kingdom of God and not choose it? See, in my view, that that's impossible. In my view, if you can see the kingdom of God, you will choose it. And I believe that's in line with the creation story. I believe that God created human beings to worship himself and glorify himself and, and be in relationship with himself. And, and what, if you saw that kingdom, and you could actually know who Jesus was and, and what he did for you, how could you turn away? I mean, how could you, how could you see the lifeline and not take the lifeline? Well, I believe that everybody who sees the lifeline takes it. And, and that is not what an Arminian believes or, or a Molinist or whatever. You just believe in libertarian free will. You believe that people actually understand God and still say no. And I say, why? why? What, what makes you different from, from your brother who can't understand God because you're somehow better? Well, I mean, and then, and then this even, this gets more complicated. I don't really want to get too far into it, but it gets more complicated because if God created you and he, and he created you in the time and place that he wanted, which is a clear passage from, I, I can't remember what that that's, that's, that's Paul says that, you know, he, that he has determined the times and places of everyone's birth. Um, so nobody's at fault or whatever. And, and so if God has done all that and he was crafting you in the womb, that's like another passage from the Bible. Didn't he give you the ability to choose? And, and, and your other buddy didn't get the ability to choose. I, I what, what, what is different between you and him? You're really just better. You know, this is an argument that I used to dismiss. Um, uh, and people just go, well, no, it's free will. And I'm like, no, think about it. What makes you better than the human standing next to you? It's what God has done for you. And so that to me is the sort of humility and, 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 and wonder of Calvinism is that I am no better than anybody. I didn't choose to believe in God over somebody else. It's not like there was something in me that was better than my, than my fellow brother. God gave me salvation. And I can't take credit for that. And my experience was very Calvinistic. I mean, my conversion experience was I had no idea why I started getting interested in God. Like suddenly I just was obsessed. And, and I don't know why. I mean, I had no really no reason. I mean, I had a girlfriend. I was doing decent in school. I mean, yeah, sure. The, the world was going to hell in the handbasket, but like didn't, that didn't necessitate my need to jump on Jesus as savior. Like I could have just settled with a deistic God who created human beings. I didn't need Jesus really. I mean, I do, but and in my own secular conception, I don't need Jesus. I just became so fascinated. And then my sin just started destroying me. My, the weight of my sin was crushing me. And it's like, I didn't do that. That didn't come from me. That came from God. And that seemed so evidently clear in my experience in the Bible. And, and, and I eventually was like, I guess I'm a Calvinist. And, uh, and now I defend it as gospel truth. I think that Calvinism is, is, uh, and I, I hate using that word sometimes because it's like, oh, that's John Calvin's religion. It's like, no, I think Jesus was a Calvinist. And I, I don't, I don't mean that he believed everything John Calvin believed, but I think, no, I believe Jesus Christ picked himself a people. He called out a people to himself after God, the father gave him those people. And, um, and when he was talking to people and he says, you're not going to believe me because you can't understand what I'm saying. He literally meant it. He was like, those people like, it doesn't matter what I do. I can do a miracle. I can do anything I want. You're not going to believe in me because you hate me. And that, that, I, Jesus didn't say those words, but he said, you can't, you will not listen because you can't understand. Not because you won't understand. You literally cannot understand. Jesus looked at those people and said, you cannot understand me. It's impossible for you to understand me because you don't like me. That, that, that's what I believe that Jesus was saying. And it makes a lot of the Bible make way more sense in my opinion. And, and, uh, and it also is a, why I, why I would get really passionate about it. I'll, I'll cut myself off here to let other people get in. But I used to get really passionate about this because, because to me, it's like thinking that you chose God over your fellow man and that he didn't do that for you is rejecting the grace that he has shown you. God literally, you, you couldn't look at him. You, you were, your face was turned the other direction. You weren't just like flapping around in the ocean. You weren't flapping around in the ocean looking for a savior. You were sunk at the bottom of the ocean, dead, screwed. And God pulls you out of the ocean, turned your head towards him and said, follow me. And then you follow. And that's just such a different like experience and understanding of salvation than, oh, like I chose and he didn't choose. Everybody can choose, you know, like for whatever reason I chose 
it has to be because you're better. Like it has to be in my opinion. But anyway, it's just such a different understanding of salvation. It's so important to understand that you're literally, you were literally sucked out of just absolute destruction. You were just totally hosed. You had no shot. You hated God. And then God made you love him. And they say, oh, that's a violation of free will. It's like, really? Do you want to go there? Like, you think it's a bad thing that God changed your heart so that you love him? I mean, come on. I don't know. I don't know. Doesn't seem right to me. It seems completely beautiful that God took a dead being, spiritually dead person, and made them alive so they could love him. And they say, well, how come he didn't save everybody? And that's where Calvinism gets really, that's where you get, that's the really sticky question, I think, for most people as well. Okay, I can buy all that, but how come he just doesn't save everybody then? Um, and, and I think that's really where the rubber like really hits the road on the Calvinism debate. That's the big question. Why doesn't God save everybody then? If he, if he can save everyone, why doesn't he? And I really think that's like the, the, one of the big sticking points. But, um, and uh, and it, 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 it's admittedly like not an easy thing to like think about, but I think there's some good answers. I think the Bible provides some good answers. So yeah, anyway, that's how I became a Calvinist. Slowly, the logic, the reason, the experience, just the, 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 the sort of the glory of it in my opinion. There's some stuff I didn't get into. I, I talked mostly propositions there, um, but there's also some experiential Calvinism that's just like really, like really like next level, like, uh, you know, um, you know, praying to God for him every single day. What you do is you go up and you try your hardest and you pray for God to give you the strength to do it. And if you don't, you just do the same thing the next day. And you know that when you succeed, it was all of God. And when you fail, it was all your fault. And that's, that's a beautiful thing in my opinion. It's like when you succeed, it's all of God. And when you fail, it's all you. And I think that's beautiful. And, and, and I think that, um, you know, God telling a story in time is also beautiful. It's like a Calvinism. I really like sometimes I like to call it like this, like the, the. It, it accurately reflects God's storytelling. It, it makes God the author of history, actually. And, and I think that's beautiful. Everything I do has meaning. Everything that happens to me has meaning. God did not construct anything in this world without meaning. And it makes the world a, you know, it's a fallen, you know, mess, but it makes the world have purpose in the most meaningful ways sometimes. And it allows me to just be happy. I mean, I'm not happy all the time, but it allows me to be happy and be joyous um, a lot more than I think any other system would, because I can trust that everything is happening is happening because God is God and he's in control. And so I don't need to fret when things don't go my way because God is not doing anything that doesn't have purpose. And, and there's some serious um, benefits to understanding that there's nothing better in you than your brother next to you. Um, I, I know when I talk to people that, you know, the reason they don't believe in God and I believe in God isn't because I somehow was smart enough or, or, or right enough to make the good decision. No, it's, it's because they can't like, like, they, like, they, like they can't, they literally can't. And that's, it's, it's sad, it, but, it, but it also allows you to have a great level of sympathy for people when they do evil things. It's like, you were once that person, you were once that person who could do nothing but evil. And, 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 and you have to sympathize with that. And there's nothing in you that's better. You, you can look at them and say, God saved me. And he's offering his hand out to you and he can save you too, you know? And, and then hopefully, in that moment, God's working in them. The spirit is working in them. And, and, and that's, and that's a beautiful thing also. So I think there's some really, you know, you know, participatory, you know, things about Calvinism that really like just send it through the roof as far as it, as far as the theology goes, but, and I've lived those things out more in the, mo in my last like three months as, as a Calvinist or whatever, maybe because I've been at college with people who are sinners and I've, I've been a sinner and I've lived out, you know, sinful things. Um, but really, I think my Calvinism has helped a lot. And it's, it's, it's not this dark, gloomy, you know, like uh, monster, like, oh, you know, I look at people and I say, oh, you're damned because you don't believe in Jesus and there's nothing you can do about it. It's like, no, 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 no. It's the opposite. It's the complete opposite. But we can get into that. I said a lot of things. That's my Calvinism conversion story. Here I am. And, uh, and yeah, you, go ahead. Let's, let's get into it. It is pretty bloody hilarious. What kind of a turnaround you had? <laughs> I know it's. I, I, I'm a. I'm ashamed. I'm ashamed. <laughs> oh, it's great. I, I think what you were hitting on. There were three three kind of main points that um, that are important to highlight. I, I think the one issue that a lot of people have with Calvinism, it, it's what I call the offensive sovereignty or the offensive divine sovereignty. 
where it is honestly a bit offensive to think that there is someone or that that God is actually, you know, better than you. There, there is a certain um, self-centeredness. Well, you know, obviously I believe in total depravity. So, but there is a certain offensiveness to sovereignty that I think a lot of people can't get over. And then there's also um, the misunderstanding, I think that can frequently come that um, the necessity of regeneration somehow um, detracts from the free offer of the gospel which is not at all the case, but I can see how people would misinterpret it that way because the gospel is freely offered to everybody. Anybody who believes, they get salvation. Not everybody believes, but the offer is still out there for everybody. And then of course there is the perennial, you know, more pastoral issue, I suppose, of. Um, why doesn't everybody believe? Like, why isn't everybody elect? And, you know, I, I don't think that's, uh, I don't think that's something that's easy to deal with. And I mean, I'm sure we all have family, friends, loved ones who, uh, who are not Christians, and it just aches. But um, yeah, that's, that's, I think, an issue that won't, won't be easily resolved this side of eternity. So, yeah. I was kind of thinking the same thing about why doesn't everybody believe? Um, and what came to mind when you were talking, Colton, was um, I had had this long belief, probably about eh, eight years or so that, or maybe more, that if people just knew who Jesus was, if they knew what he was like, how could they not want to give their whole life to him and want to follow after him and know him and love him? And um, I can't remember who it was, but somebody brought this up in my Bible study and was like, uh, did that happen when Jesus was a man on earth? Because they knew what he was like. They were around him physically, talking to him like we would another human and they rejected him and even killed him. And so I think um, that belief that I had, or, or at least desire of wanting everyone to believe Jesus kind of got thrown out the window in, not in the sense of like, I definitely still desire that everyone, for everyone to know him, um, but I, I think what got thrown out the window is kind of the reality that that's not going to happen. <laughs> and, and, you know, I think that there's a very real, okay, I think there's a very real truth in what you said, like, if only people could know the way I know, let's say, because um, though I'm not a fan of subjectivism, I mean, we do have subjective, you know, opinions, because we are, you know, we aren't God, right? Um, I think they correspond to truth if, you know, but anyway, we don't have to get into that. Um, I think that if you subjectively knew what I know about God, at least forget all the Calvinism, Jesus Christ is Lord. I'm a sinner. I need his salvation. The very basic gospel message, everything else wrote out. If you could understand that, I don't actually see anybody turning that down. I, I don't. I think, that's, I think that your inclination is like, if they only knew then they would believe. You're right. You're, you're, you're absolutely right. That's why Jesus tells people, you don't believe in me because you can't understand. Like if you would understand, you would. You believe in me, but you, but you can't. Um, and I think that's a very like natural and real like thought to have. It's like, it's like we as human beings, if we can see the glory of the Father, if we can see the kingdom of heaven, we will choose it because that's what we're meant to do. But the reason people don't isn't because, I mean, they do make a free will choice to reject God. Like as God does not force them to reject him. So that's, that's the thing that had, I, that took me a really long time to figure that out, but eventually I figured it out. People, God, the only thing God has to do, or Charles Spurgeon has an amazing quote. Um, I think it's 
free will has damned many a soul, but has never sent one to heaven. And what he means by that is people freely choose to reject God all the time. The only time they choose God is after God has done something in them, after he has replaced that heart of stone with the heart of flesh. And see, but once they can see, I, they, they can't reject Jesus. And I think that makes sense. I mean, I think that makes a lot of sense that the, the beings that were designed to worship God, once they can see, once they can know, once they can really know, right? Um, we can talk about Jonathan Verveke's four Ps or whatever, but I think most people will understand what I mean by that. Once you can really know God, once, you, once you're in relationship with God, that's maybe a good way to put it. Um, if you can have that, if you can understand who he is and what he is and what he did for you, then you will believe. The problem is people can't understand in their default state because of what happened in the garden and, and, and how people deal with the knowledge of good and evil. Now, there's some mystery there, but the way I see it, when we took that apple and we, we got the knowledge of good and evil, we couldn't handle it, basically. We, we kind of distorted we, we, with that knowledge because we're not infinite beings. We, we distort what, you know, um, what, what, what it means to be good, what it means to be evil. We set up for ourselves our own gods and our own idols. And, and only with the help of God can we actually put things in the correct order. And again, I am no better than anybody else in Calvinism. I am the worst of sinners, you know, at least the old man is or whatever. I mean, I still sin, don't get me wrong, but just trying to use correct terminology here. You know, I'm just like Paul, I can say I'm chief of sinners. Um, but but God has chosen me. Um, and 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 there's nothing and and what does Paul say? He says he he has done this, you know, and I don't want to butcher the butcher the, the the verse but but he essentially says he's done this to, you know to bring glory to himself to, to make his you know goodness known is a, is, a, is a good way of putting that and and the same is true with me it's like i am so grateful to god because he didn't have to do what he did like he didn't have to extend his mercy to me and see that that's like the next level like type calvinism right there it's like you don't know how lucky you are because god picked you out of the divine counsel of his will and, and you and you you won the lottery this is is, is is kind of a way of thinking about it god doesn't like roll dice but it's just like you did not necessarily have to get this not everyone does but you got it so it's like how are you gonna how's that knowledge gonna change you how are you gonna behave with that knowledge it changed me a lot um it's calvinism has been ridiculously helpful to me um and uh, we can get into the, I think, part, maybe the hardest question, which is why doesn't he save everybody if he can do that? But, but, um, but I mean, there are just so many, uh, it is, I would call that a negative or whatever, like, or, a, or, a, or, a, or a stumbling block for Calvinism. But there are so many good things about it that I just feel like a lot of people don't understand and, 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 don't, and don't know, you know? And uh, so I guess that's kind of why we're here. Yeah, this is definitely all new territory for me hearing about Calvinism. I was um, under the firm conviction that Calvinists believe that there is no free will at all. And so I was kind of um, wondering about that mention of the puppeteering God. And wondering like, what is Calvinism if it's not that? And you've kind of touched on that already, but I'm still, I don't know, something's not clicking in my brain, I guess. <laughs> Can I butt in? Yeah, go ahead. I was yeah, going to ask you if you want to take a stab. Yeah. Okay. Well, um, something that might be helpful in this, or at least was helpful for me, was, and you don't need to have buy the book because honestly it goes on forever it's one of those puritan things you know they run on sentences anyway but um there was a guy named thomas boston and he wrote a book called human nature in its fourfold state or something to that effect anyway he was going into this and the basic idea is a person is going to act well anything act according to its nature. So a rock is going to drop to the ground because 
it has mass and there's gravity and acceleration, you know, uh, a person acts according to their nature too. Um, so the, he breaks it down into um, four states of humanity, uh, sort of four natures of the human will. The first one being um, human nature at creation. That's when Adam and Eve did legitimately have a free choice whether or not to sin. You know, they had a choice whether or not to eat the fruit. And, you know, you know the story. They, they, they chose to, they chose to, uh, to eat the fruit. But because they had a truly free nature at creation, therefore they were free to act in whatever way appealed to them. In, uh, in humanity's fallen state, we act in accordance with our fallen desires. So part of that, which is what um, total depravity means, is that we don't necessarily, uh, we, we don't choose to embrace God because we find him beautiful, because we love him. Maybe we find him useful, you know, that's, you, you find a lot of religious people who uh, get some utility out of God. But in humanity's fallen state, they don't truly love God and find him beautiful unless he intervenes. And uh, so that's kind of what it's coming down to with the free will. It's, it's not that a person in their fallen state is somehow prevented by God from choosing to serve him. It's that they don't want to. Like you, you just literally don't want to in the same way that a rock is not going to float in the air. It, it, you don't want to. But if God does intervene in his grace and save you, well, then you have a redeemed will. And that, that gets a lot more hairy because then you're thinking about things like sanctification where, you know what? The longer I'm a Christian, the more I realize I sin a whole lot. And it just will nag you more and more. And there's, there's a sort of a duality because you have that old nature that still lives with you, but also you have the, the redeemed nature, the being united to Christ and wanting to serve him and love him. And, you know, uh, to complete the, the, the framework of the four natures, there's also the, um, the glorified state, uh, that which remains to be known in the new heavens and the new earth where our wills will wholly and continually just be to serve and love God. Does that make sense? Uh, anywhere that you'd like me to elaborate? Like, I'm not assuming this is going to click right away, but this was helpful for me. Yes, that is helpful. Um, we're saying that the witnesses quite in between Kaylin, uh, your microphone is kind of like muffled and muted. So I don't know if there's like, you like pulled your phone away or like pulled the mic away from your face or it's connectivity, but you need to like probably repeat the last like couple seconds. Basically just start over from when Anne, or, oh, I'm so sorry. I, I used to call, I used to shorten your name. When, <laughs> it's so, I'm so I'm, that's a really, that's a really bad thing. Um, defaulting, but uh, yeah, just kind of start over from when she like asked you, like if that was helpful. Okay, can you hear me okay now? Yes, yes ma'am. Okay, so uh, I like what you're saying about um, the sanctity of the Spirit. It's happening again. I'm sorry. <laughs> no! I, are you like pulling your mic away from your face or is it falling or something? I don't know. No, I haven't moved at all. I'm just been using my computer so I don't know if my microphone is acting up oh dear <laughs> oh well it works when you're not talking about what you need to say Dang it. <laughs> okay well just keep letting me know if it keeps cutting out I guess um 
I don't know what you guys have heard so far, so I don't know if I'm repeating myself so far. Um, the, the fallen nature and acting according to that fallen nature that in this state, we don't desire God unless he intervenes. I thought that was really interesting and um, kind of brings me back to that question, Colton, that you asked about um, what, how come he doesn't save everyone? Uh, that's maybe a whole other topic in and of itself that I just... Uh I mean, this is pretty, that, that is kind of like the big, I think, I think everyone is kind of okay with it until we get to that point. Um, I think that's really where a lot of people break down on Calvinism. It's like, okay, well, I can buy it. I like, humanity is sinful. Okay. That makes sense. Like they have a sin nature. We can't do anything but love God. Got it. But if God has the ability to save everybody, why doesn't he? And, and then, and then I think people goes, okay, well, we have to change all the axioms because those axioms that led us to that conclusion, God can't do that. God can't be like that. God can't be somebody who predestines some to hell. So we just have to tear down all those axioms and build our faith on free will or something. I think that's really where a lot of people like they, they can take it that far, but then once they get that far, they stop. They can't, they can't go that far. So then they revert back to what, what they believe. I have to do it because this is a Calvinism discussion. I have to do it um, because this is where I think you find the answer. I think the best answer to this question is in uh, Romans 9. So we're going to do it. We're going to go to the scriptures. We're going to read the passage that I'm talking about. Um, and, uh, we'll see if it helps. At least we can start the conversation there. Um, I think there's other places where this is kind of expounded upon, but I think this is the best one in my opinion. Well, uh, as, as an aside, oh, oh, sorry. Go ahead, Galen. <laughs> I'm just going to go grab my Bible so I can follow along. Oh, okay. Um, oh, I was just going to say as an aside that, um, an another important thing to note is that we don't really know who is and who is not elect you know the secret will of god is called his secret will because it's secret <laughs> you know? right, right so i think that the i think you and i would both agree that the bible clearly presents that some are not elect um, uh yes uh, such as uh judas iscariot sure you know? sure right um yeah. so uh she was not advocating for universalism there for those who listen to the conversation <laughs> but uh but that is a very important point that uh, we do not know who is elect. And I honestly believe we'll be very, I think Paul has mentioned this a couple of times, but I think we're going to be pretty surprised about who is elect uh, at the end of days. Um, I really do. Uh, as long as it's not that annoying neighbor, right? No, right, sure, sure. <laughs> uh, oh no, I need to spend eternity with Bob. <laughs> no, I just. Uh, Kaylin, <laughs> let me know when you're back. Okay. You're back? I never, I never left. Just walked oh. across my room. Oh, okay, okay. Um, all right. I don't know where I want to start. Uh, we probably don't need to read, like, the first few verses about Israel being cut off or, or, yeah. But, well, I don't know. It's kind of important. Romans 9 is so important. Um, we should probably start back in Genesis. <laughs> <laughs> uh, maybe we'll start at verse uh, 6. Oh, uh, yeah. Okay. Actually, the verse six is great because because it's it's one of the things that I, I also is important to to Calvinism. But it is not as though Romans nine verse six. But it is not as though the word of God has failed. Now let's just pause right there for a second. God's word does not fail. God never tries to save somebody and fails. This is something that's insanely important to understanding, like one of the one of the one of the consistent parts of Calvinism. And with the Bible, it's like, God does not try things. He does them. He's God. He doesn't have any limits on himself. He's God. So when he wants to save somebody, he will. That's just the reality. He doesn't try and fail. God does not fail. That is not something God does. So Paul makes that clear from the get-go. But it's not as though the word of God has failed. For not all who are descended from Israel belong to Israel. And not all the children of Abraham, because they are his offspring, but through Isaac shall your offspring be named. This means that it is not the children of the flesh who are the children of God. Okay, he's getting into kind of spiritual adoption into uh, the family of God here. Um, uh, we can skip to um, uh, maybe like verse 11. Though they were not yet born and had done nothing either good or bad. This is super important. Though they were not yet born and had done nothing either good or bad in order that God's purpose of election might continue. Not because of works, 
But because of him who calls, this is super, super, super Calvinistic. Like this is like this straight up, like, like Paul being honest here. She was told the older will serve the younger as it is written. Jacob, I loved, but Esau, I hated. Whoa. Well, God hates somebody and loves someone else. What does that mean? Doesn't God love everybody? I mean, that's a, that's a topic in and of itself, but I mean, that's that I mean, we're getting somewhere here. And then this is the super, super important part, right? Starting at verse 14, what shall we say then? Is there injustice on God's part? By no means. For he says to Moses, I will have mercy on whom I have mercy. I will save who I will save. I will choose who I will choose. And I will have compassion on whom I have compassion. So then it depends. This, this should really kill every single version of Christianity that isn't Calvinism adjacent. So then it depends not on human will or exertion, but on God who has mercy. Done. That's it. Paul just told you that God saves people, not you. And he chose Jacob over Esau, not because of anything they had done, not because they believed, not because they were good in some sense or not, not because they were righteous or unrighteous. God simply chose Jacob for his purposes and rejected Esau for his purposes. And then we, oh gosh, I closed my Bible. I'm sorry. I wanted to read a couple more things out of Romans before we talked about it. Um, okay, I'm back. Um, uh, uh, all right. So we are at verse 16. So then it depends on him, but not a human will, but God who has mercy. Okay. For the scripture says to Pharaoh, for this very purpose, I raised you up that I might show my power in you and that my name might be proclaimed in all the earth. So then he has mercy on whomever he wills and he hardens whomever he wills. Again, very Calvinistic language. There. And you say, you will say to me then, this is, this is your, this is kind of one of the big objections of people who say Calvinism is stupid. That's wrong. You will say to me then, why does he still find fault? Like if, if God predestined you to hell, why is that your fault? That's exactly what Paul is saying here. In my opinion. Like, why does, why does he still find fault for who can resist his will? If it's God's will that you're damned, how is it my fault? You know what Paul says, but who are you oh man to answer back to God? You're not God. Stop talking. Wow. That's pretty like, that's, that's kind of like a slap in the face. That's the offensive sovereignty. That that and uh, I'm so sorry. Anamik was talking about. I, I know, I do know, I do know. Anamik was talking about. She he he says he says who will answer back to God? What is a molder or what what is uh, what will what is molded say to its molder? Why have you made me like this? Has the potter no right over the clay? Here's the predestination part. Has the potter no right over the clay to make out of the same lump one vessel for honorable use, salvation, and another for dishonorable use, damnation? What if God? Desiring to show his wrath and make his power, or, or oops, I'm, I'm, used, I'm used to a different translation, and to make known his power has endured with much patience vessels of wrath prepared for destruction in order to make known the riches of his glory for vessels of mercy, which he has prepared beforehand for glory. Even us whom he has called, not from the Jews, but also from the Gentiles. Or that was a question. Oh, sorry, I read that as a statement. God damns people for you. That's what I think that passage is saying. God has damned some to make known the riches of his glory for vessels of mercy, which he has prepared beforehand for glory. I read that. That clicked for me when I was listening to a John Piper video. And John Piper was basically saying, this is one of the most difficult things in the Bible, if not the most difficult thing in the Bible. God has damned some because it glorifies himself more. Now, some people really hate that language. I don't know why, but they do. God glorifying himself. How narcissistic. Let's, let's, let's do it in a C.S. Lewis type way, maybe. God has damned some so that we may know God. God has damned some so that we may understand in totality the goodness of God. Piper phrased it like this. He said that evil or damnation or whatever the sin of the world serves as a backdrop to highlight, to contrast the good. See, the good is made known better with a backdrop because it's set against evil. We, for example, without evil, you wouldn't have forgiveness, right? So Jesus says that there is no greater deed than to lay one's life down with their friends. So you couldn't have that without evil. And that's getting, we're getting into some really, really, really deep territory. I mean, that's, that's like, wow, 
God permits evil. We had this discussion in the discord very recently, but, but yeah, he does like, like that God has done everything for his purposes to make known what's good. And that's, that's what he does. And it's, it's hard. Like I, 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 it took me forever to grasp this, but once it clicked, it clicked in a really meaningful way. Wow. God is sovereign. God has done everything with purpose. He doesn't lose anybody because he doesn't, because, because he's failing to save people. No, God has mercy on who he has mercy. He has compassion on who he has compassion. What, what shall we say to God? You know, we can't say anything. Who can resist his will? Quiet, oh man, who are you to answer back to God? God is never at fault. That's what Paul is saying. Even though this is true, God is never at fault. You have to deal with that. That's not, that's not God's problem. That's your problem. Trust him. Trust God here. And I do. That's my interpretation of the passage. Somebody could come in here and say, oh, corporate election, and you're an idiot, and you're making God out to be a monster. Fine. But I think that that's clear as day in the passage. I think that Paul is clearly talking about, that's why he's using the word will. That's why he's talking about human exertion versus God's purposes. This is, this is, this is everything. This is exactly what you want the answers to. And it's right here. Now, it's, it's, it's a mystery still. I mean, we, we can't know the secret divine counsel of God. Um, and I mean, just talked about that. Like, like we're, 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 we're finite creatures, but because we're finite creatures, we shouldn't question God. He, we, we shouldn't question his moral standing because he, he chooses to save some and not others. He has a purpose in it. We can trust him in that. There, there is purpose in what he's doing. And we can also understand that nobody deserves salvation. This is kind of the, this kind of the, this is kind of the, the, the built-in assumption of these people. It's like, well, everyone deserves a chance. Why? That's not, that's not true. God could damn you justly without ever extending the offer of the gospel. Maybe some people disagree with that. I think that's true. Um, I think that the, what's, what's a mystery is why God saves anybody. And I mean, he t- it tells us why. It's because God is merciful and he's good and he's great. I mean, that's why God saves you. I know. But, but from your perspective, if somebody would constantly do you evil, do you harm, that, that, that's exactly what humans do to God. Constantly, God is infinitely holy and perfect. Every single time we sin, we just, we do a mighty blow to God. And not, not, we don't hurt his standing as a cosmic being. I mean, God is completely sufficient in himself, but, but it grieves God that his creation constantly, constantly rejects him. And, and, and we do things worthy of damnation. We do things worthy of, of eternal punishment, whatever that looks like. Okay. I don't, I don't know what it looks like. Maybe it's annihilation. Maybe it's eternal conscious torment, whatever that is, you know, I don't know, but we, we do things worthy of our eternal destruction constantly but god in his mercy allows us to live he endures with long suffering vessels of wrath um so it's our fault it, it's totally our fault it, it, we, we don't deserve salvation that's why it's mercy and and that's why god has mercy on who he has mercy what, what, what's what's crazy is that god is so good and merciful and forgiving that he actually reaches down to those who hate him and says, no, love me. And they do. If that happened in real life, if somebody would come to your house, shoot it up, defame your family, slander you constantly, call you a liar, thief, murderer, would you extend that same forgiveness to them that God extends to all the thieves and murderers and liars? I don't think we would. I think we'd be like, no, that person deserves to go to jail, probably. The person deserves to, uh, you know, meet justice. And everyone deserves that justice. But God, in his mercy, forgives them. And that's the real, that's the real wonder. It's, it, it's not, it's not, oh, how come God doesn't, it's like, well, why did he save me? I'm so awful. It's because he loves me that much. That's, that's really the, the angle you should be taking, in my opinion. Um, Okay, there's my Romans 9 rant. Well, and as a caveat, um, you do have to say, though, that if God had willed it, he could have saved everybody. Yes. Uh, He's not bound by our sin. Um, But he doesn't, and he's said as much. So, you know, (laughs) suck it up, deal with it, you know? But, um, yeah... For sure. It's not that he owes salvation to anyone. It's that extending salvation, extending his grace to people is 
an act of abundant grace and it would have been equally as just for him to have condemned us as to have saved us and it would not have contradicted his mercy to condemn us either like he he does not contradict himself I'd be curious to hear the the opposing view of what you just said that in like if somebody is equally confident and has thought it all the way through I'd love to hear like the opposing view of understanding Romans 9 from somebody else too but um, you definitely need to hear the point we're working on <laughs> um so there are definitely opposing views uh, there are people who think that Calvinism is actually evil and makes a monster out of God. Um, I think that Luke believes that, so you can talk to him about it. Um, <laughs> but <laughs> just, I'm teasing Luke. Um, I can give you my best steel man. It's not going to be the best steel man. I mean, I can give you my quick best steel man. Um, basically, uh, I'm taking the passage to literally or something like that. Uh, Romans 9 is talking about corporate election. Uh, basically God has elected those in Christ, uh, which I think, by the way, is a non sequitur. It's kind of like a tautology. It, it doesn't really do anything. Like it, it doesn't say anything. God has elected those who are in Christ. Well, yeah, of course they're in Christ. Like, y y like, uh, sorry, I'm, I'm, I'm already taking down my steel man, but, but there is a serious problem when you say that election just means that God chooses those who choose him. That's not election. Like, <laughs> I don't know, but I'll try and steal man some more without inter interjecting. So God has corporately elected those who are in Christ. That means that he has elected those who, who, have, who are in the body. So basically what it's saying is maybe it's more so talking about final destination or something like that. that that's like the predest oh, predestination doesn't mean that you're, it, it means that the train is going, this is an analogy that people use all the time. I think it's stupid, but, but the train is going somewhere. It's predestined to go wherever it's going to go, but you know, you can just get on if you want. And, and then you'll go there because the train is predest predestined to go somewhere. I think that you're stripping these words of their meanings when you say stuff like that and just, just kind of making a mockery of them because that's not what anybody would mean. Uh, like if I said this event was predestined to happen, you, it, it doesn't mean that somebody got on a train and like made it happen. It's like, no, it, was, it means it was going to happen no matter what. So like it, it ruins the golden chain of redemption in my opinion. I'm totally destroying my steel man, but whatever, we're going to go with it. Um, it totally ruins the golden chain of redemption where Paul says, those who were predestined were called. He, he, doesn't, say, he, he doesn't say those who were justified were predestined. He says, meaning, you know, they chose, so they got on the train and then they went somewhere. No, those who were predestined were called Right, so God predestined these people were to be called. Those who are called are justified, and those who are justified were glorified. So if you were predestined, you were called, and if you were called, you were justified, and if you were justified, you were glorified. That means you were saved if you were predestined. That's, I think, a very logical interpretation of that sentence. Um, but they, they would say, the, the, the opposers, uh, uh, the, or the Armenian at least, um, would say that, no, this is corporate election. So the body of Christ is corporately elect, God is electing people unto salvation who have chosen him in Christ. Um, I, don't, I don't know how you explain the passage that says, um, you know, it is not based on human will or exertion, but God. I, I don't know how you explain that. I could never. I, I couldn't do it. Personally, I couldn't do it. Um, uh, maybe yeah, you would say that. that I was curious about because I, uh, verse, well, let me find it further down uh 22 what if god wanting to show his wrath and to make his power known endured with much long suffering the vessels of wrath prepared for destruction uh that one i heard somebody say the what if part is hypothetical it's not if you look at the greek it's like it's it's like it's rhetorical it's like an if there actually is no what it's just like if it just says like if god designed to do this did this I, interesting yeah it's That's not there so is no what yeah the there's person, no what yeah. person who told me studies greek oh, oh there i you we can uh yeah i mean i don't know that's 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 my understanding uh 
Anamik, I don't know if you have a better understanding or if I'm wrong there, but um, uh, from what I can tell, the, the, the correct interpretation of the Greek is that God, or Paul is not being hypothetical at all. Uh, he's, he's being rhetorical. Um, he, he's saying this is how it is. And, and, and honestly, if you follow the argument, that's what exactly what it seems like, in my opinion. Like, I don't think if you follow the argument after he says uh, it doesn't depend on human will or exertion, but on God, and he has mercy on who he has mercy and he has, has compassion on who he has compassion, why would he throw in that hypothetical just, just if it's not true? Like, I, yeah, it doesn't, that's, doesn't, that's kind of what I was pointing at. So, not, yeah. Can you hear me? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, sorry. That one part that I was hearing somebody say is hypothetical wouldn't add up with those other verses that you're saying are very clear. I mean, and, and to me, they are clear. I mean, I, I, I'm not trying to play God here in this discussion. I just, to me, you know, there are people who disagree with me. And, you know, there's great minds who disagree with me. Uh, you know, uh, John Wesley disagreed with me. He's a very holy man, far holier than me. I have a lot of respect for the Wesley brothers. Um, you know, they disagree. They say, no, 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 that's not what's going on. But, but I cannot interpret this any other way after I sort of, after because before i was interpreting it i was saying okay yeah corporate election okay so i can read a passage like um in order that god's purpose of election might continue okay yeah the election of israel or something right there's a lot of people will bring that up okay they will say that um verse 11 though they were not yet born and had done nothing either good or bad in order that god's purpose of election might continue election of israel not like elect unto salvation um that that's what they that's what they're saying there so God chose Jacob over Esau uh, because he wanted Jacob to be Israel, right? Jacob is Israel, uh, not Esau. Uh, but that has nothing to do with salvation. They're saying Esau could have been saved, uh, whatever. Even if that's true, um, I don't think it really meshes, meshes with the rest of the argument. So whenever I would interpret Romans 9 before, I'd kind of interpret it in pieces. I would never follow the argument from beginning to end. I'd, I'd kind of say like, oh, I can explain away this verse by that and explain away that verse by that, explain away that verse by that. But Paul is talking about salvation from the very beginning of the chapter, because he's, he's saying, but it's not as though the word of God has failed, uh, for not all those who are descended from Israel belong to Israel. He's talking about being grafted into Israel, which is God's elect people. That's exactly what he's talking about. So he's talking about election unto salvation. And, and, if you, and, and, and you know that he is, because again, at the end of Romans, or not 12, which is not the end of Romans, but it's the end of this sort of like sidestep in Romans, uh, he's talking about being grafted into the tree and being cut off. So he's talking about salvation the whole time. He is. I, I don't know how you could say that he's not. Um, and why, why that particular example voids that, even if that's true, even if Esau was saved, um, it clearly shows that God can choose. And he's talking about choosing people. And that's a good example because he's talking about choosing people who are in Israel and who aren't in Israel, Israel being the elect, in, in my opinion here. Um, for, not, for not all who are descended from Israel belong to Israel. Clearly. If he says that, Israel is more than just Jews. Um, I, I, that's, I think that's a clear thing to understand um, from, from that. And then also at the end of Romans 12, when he's talking about people being grafted into the olive tree, I mean, that's, again, that's more, more salvation stuff, being part of Israel, God's elect people. And, and, and might I add that God literally elected a group of people in history to be his people. Uh, that's what he did. Like God elects all the time. It's his, that's his thing. He chooses people for his purposes. He actually chose a people to represent him in contrast with the pagans. Um, I don't believe people were saved if they, unless they knew of God, you know, and this is kind of a complicated position because people object to this like, oh, so like Plato and Aristotle, they had no chance of being saved. I don't think so, man. I don't think so. It doesn't make sense. They didn't have knowledge of God. Uh, people who were of Israel had knowledge of God or people who were of, you know, God's chosen people in the Old Testament up to Israel, like Noah and, you know, Adam or whatever. I don't know what Adam's position is in history, um, but you know what I'm saying? Like the only people who have knowledge of God uh, are saved or, or it can be saved even, because if you don't have knowledge of God, this is also in Romans, um, you know, how can they believe if they haven't heard, uh, you know, and who's going to make them here if someone doesn't go preach, et cetera. I mean, Paul emphasizes that you need to know about God to be saved, I think there. And then that kind of throws out the window, the sort of virtuous pagan thing as well. But that's kind of a different topic. We don't really need to get into that. I, I, I just think that Romans 9, getting back to the problem at hand, Romans 9 is talking about salvation. I think it clearly is. And then so to say that the election is about Israel the whole time, 
I think is to ignore the, the logical flow of the argument all the way through. To say that the election is corporate is weird a little bit because like, again, the Jacob and Esau example is very personal. Uh, uh, and he talks about human will and exertion. Again, I, 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 for, for him to be talking about just electing those who have elected him basically uh, seems strange. Um, people would say that like, what if God is trying to show his wrath and make his power known has endured much with much pace and vessels of wrath prepared for destruction. They might say that, oh, well, they're prepared for destruction because God knows they won't choose. Uh, God knows they won't choose him. That's why they're prepared for destruction. Vessels of mercy uh, are, they're, they're prepared. They have, they have a place prepared beforehand in heaven because God knows they will choose him. So that's how they are elect. But, but again, it, it sort of ignores some of the more, you know, crucial parts of the argument, like human will or exertion, or he will have mercy on whoever he wills and hardens whomever he wills. Um, uh, and then, and then it completely ignores the rhetorical question that gets asked, why does he still find fault for who can resist his will? It's like, no, if, if it's corporate election, then he, people aren't resisting his will. He's letting people choose freely or whatever. And, and so I, I just think it kind of makes a mockery out of, out of the argument that's being presented in Romans nine, if we try and use corporate election, um, which is again, God elects those who are in Christ. Um, but I, I don't think Paul's even saying anything meaningful there. Like if they're in Christ, of course, they're already elect. Like, um, I guess you could try and say that, uh, you know, God is promising that if you're in Christ, there is something prepared before you, uh, prepared for you. And, and, and I sympathize with that argument, but I really don't think it makes sense when you follow everything through in Romans 9. But, but that would be the alternate inter interpretation is that election or predestination is more of like a final destination uh, that God has prepared for all those who are in Christ. But you have to be in Christ for, uh, for that to make sense. And you know what, if all we had was Romans 9, maybe we could go off of that. But the problem is we have stuff like John 8 and John 6 and John 10 uh, and, you know, Ephesians and other parts of Romans, like Romans 8, where it says, you know, those, like, the golden chain again. And there's, so there's so much that's just pointing you towards, no, this is the better interpretation of Romans 9, mine, or well, the Calvinistic one. Um, and uh, I'm not the best guy to talk to this about because I have a, you know, I was in that thought process i was in the corporate election romans 9 is talking about um you know just god electing those who have elected him or whatever i was in that thought process and then when i came into calvinism i realized how stupid that was in my opinion like it just, it just didn't make any sense um and so i'm probably not the best guy to steel man it but that is like the other direction so um i would encourage you just from an intellectual perspective and also for the sake of your faith because you know i don't think i'm wrong but i might be uh, you know, talk to somebody who is all in on corporate election or talk to a Molinist or whatever. Uh, they, they may present you with um, a uh, reading of Romans 9 that is different than mine. Um, but I think that they're fundamentally fighting that question um, in Romans 9 that Paul asks, that he anticipates people will ask when, he, when they read this, which is, why does he still find fault for who can resist his will? And I just don't think that question gets answered when you talk about corporate election. I think it does when you're talking about Calvinism um, or, uh, or Augustinian theology or however you want to say it. So um, I talked a lot. I'm a talker. I'm sorry. Please, somebody stop me. <laughs> All right. <laughs> I am going to push back a bit on you, uh, Colton, uh, in that you kind of inferred that you think that the only way that people may be saved is through the, uh, through the regular means of grace um that's not to say that they aren't the regular means of grace but even if you look at um i think it's the westminster confession or was it the shorter catechism i think it was the confession uh if you look at the confession it even says um you know the preaching of the word the sacraments uh well the preaching of the word is the ordinary means by which god calls his children um, but there is a caveat even in the text there to say well, that doesn't mean it's the only way and that those who have not heard must necessarily not be saved. Now, um, you've got to ask why wouldn't God use his ordinary means? Um, so personally, I, am, I do think that uh, I do believe in uh, universal infant salvation because these people, these children never would have heard 
the gospel. Um, but that's getting into a whole nother can of worms. But that's to say that um, while I do agree that um, by far the ordinary means by which people are saved is through the preaching of the word. And then the means of grace are of course the sacraments, communion of saints, etc. That that's not to say that salvation rests in these things in and of themselves, but that God normally chooses to use these means. I mean, fair enough. I mean, that, that's not, yeah, that actually, I, I will say that I might be kind of conservative in my Calvinism as far as who gets election in my personal beliefs, but, but actually in the Calvinist system, and I think it is important to point out that in the Calvinist system, God can actually save anybody he wants to. I do believe that. I just don't know if that's how he does it. Um, I, don't, I don't know if he goes about the infant question is kind of different. I was thinking more of people who have actually lived and sinned. And, you know, I, I, I wasn't necessarily thinking about that, but it's good to point out. I mean, it's, it's fair criticism. Um, right. I just have a soft spot for babies, really. <laughs> sure, sure, sure. And, uh, and and God actually can save uh, whoever he wants in, in Calvinism. And and so that's true. Uh, that doesn't need to be a stumbling block. That's a personal opinion of mine that isn't necessarily consistent across you know calvinist understanding i think there are a lot of calvinists who would agree with me maybe uh but there's also a lot who may di disagree with me so um uh that's not essential to calvinism that was just my opinion so. right right it's just a tangent sure 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 and oh I, I mean it's an interesting tangent because basically the uh the argument well i don't know if you can use argument but it's basically um that in this case the ordinary means would not be applicable that God makes it clear that he loves to save people and he particularly embraces children. And, you know, I, <laughs> well, I do have a soft spot for kids. So, you know what, uh, I'll, I'll take the most charitable interpretation I can. <laughs> uh. Anyway, sorry for that tangent. No, it's okay. It's okay. It's fair. It was fair. Uh, say a lot, you know, it's a lot coming out of my mouth and you, glad that you picked up on something that might have been a stumbling block to people honestly um so appreciate it i have another question about um what do calvinists believe about sin nature oh boy well it's gonna vary a little bit <laughs> it's not it's i don't think it's totally consistent um there's a general like idea that i think is presented in the bible there's so many reasons why uh we're, we're doing a lot of propositional debate here which i think calvinism really shines honestly in this area because it's so logically consistent um i would like to discuss some more participatory you know knowledge um to use the for piece uh right, at some right. point but we'll but it's good I have no idea what the four P's are and what they mean. Uh, it's okay. I probably I should have said that much earlier. That's okay. I mean, I think you understand what I mean by propositional knowledge and participatory knowledge, maybe, right? Just by context. Participatory, maybe not propositional. Oh, okay. Propositional is like, these are just statements of fact, kind of. Like, oh, okay. like, like, this is a statement of fact. Like, like, for example, we're arguing from the text. We're using logic and reason. We're saying, you know, you know, God does this you know, because, because he said so in this fashion and like, this is just a fact, right? And then participatory knowledge would be like, I am actively like engaging in my relationship with God or like sort of understanding God through participation in his, um, his will and his world and his nature and, and things like that. So like participatory Calvinism would be like, you know, like I wake up every day and I work I, and I live as if um, everything that happens to me, you know, has purpose. That'd be more participatory. Like, because that would, that that would be me, you know, sort of engaging with with God in, in a way that um, where, where I know because because I am in relationship with Him and I know Him, I participate uh, in the world and with Him in such a way that that reflects my knowledge of God. Uh, maybe that's not as verbaiky as it needs to be. Honestly, I don't really like the four Ps, so that's what I mean by it. Like like it just means that like you know it's application more so like the application of my knowledge. Right. This is. Uh, J.I. Packer talks about this a lot in Knowing God, which is a great book, like I said. Um, it's like, we can have all these ideas about God, but what does that mean? Like, 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 what does that mean for your life? Like, how are you going to apply that? Like, okay, God elects some and doesn't elect others. Like, well, how is that useful to you? Uh, not in just a utilitarian way, but like for your relationship with God, right? Or, or why, 
why is it useful to know that, you know, we have a sin nature and God saved us and gave us a new heart of flesh versus a heart of stone? Like, how do you apply that? Because as a mere proposition, it really does nothing. You know, I can be a theologian and know everything about God and know nothing about God at the same time, if that makes sense. If all of my knowledge is merely like uh, surface level and I, and I don't actually engage with God, well, that's not, that's not, that's not deep knowledge of God to use the sort of like C.S. Lewis type meaning of deep, you know, um, that's not, that's not real knowledge of God. And then people don't get that knowledge unless they engage with God, you know, like you need to engage with him to have that sort of relationship. That's, that's, that's kind of necess necessary, but these theological truths, these theological propositions, this is where I disagree with like everybody. Um, these theological propositions are super useful because you can apply them and make them participatory, but like you can participate in the proposition. Um, which is why I think propositions are super useful. Um, I, so I disagree with like a lot of people on BOM, like because of that, but I love propositions because you can use them. Uh, actually, they're not just like statements that are useless. They are statements that are useless if you don't use them, you know, but anyway, tangential. If, if I may, I, um, when I was away at school for uh, theology, uh, one of my teachers ha had this thing he said where, uh, Theology is, um, it's empty without doxology, i.e. that if it doesn't work fruit in your life, then you're kind of missing the, the entire point of it. Not that the propositions of themselves are not true, but that it's not bearing any fruit in your life. And if anything, will only condemn you. Um, but also, like, if you, you can find the same sort of idea with... Um, with Paul in his letter to the Corinthians, you know, chapter 13 the, of first Corinthians, where he's saying, you know, if, if I have great understanding, but not love, you know, what's the point? So there is a both and. I feel like I just killed the chat. <laughs> No, I think I'm waiting for Kaylin to like restate what she stated originally because I forgot why I started talking about propositions and participatory knowledge. Yeah, sorry. Um, oh, you um, asked me a propositional question. Okay, yeah, what was it? Yes, I was wondering what Calvinists believe about the same nature. Oh, right. Okay. All right. With that tangent out of the way, basically, yeah. really to be a Calvinist, this is really all you have to believe. Like you don't really even have to change your views about free will that much, though I think that you should. Basically, what you have to believe is that we're free to make any decision except choose God until God allows us to make that decision. And then we choose him necessarily because he has loved us first. And so we will love him back because we can do, no, do nothing but choose God. Once we see all his goodness and all his glory, that's kind of like extra biblical expansion on what Calvinism is. But at base, all you have to believe is that we have a sin nature that, okay, let's just get into it. Total depravity. Um, is really better stated probably as radical corruption. That's what, R.C. Sprawl used to say, total depravity, total depravity seems like it's saying utter depravity, which means that we do nothing but evil constantly, which is wrong. Uh, it's just flat out wrong. And I, I don't like, um, I don't have to like, I, anybody is like, even Hitler loved his own mother, I think probably, or somebody in his life. So, so it's not that, it's not that um, uh, everything we do is wholly evil. It's that there's nothing we do is wholly good. See, that's the difference. Okay. Total depravity means there's nothing we do that's wholly good. Every single part of our being is radically corrupt. So there's not, there's not a single part of our being that has not been tainted by sin. And so what this means is that, like, um, as a human being with a sin nature, like, I can love my children and, and, uh, and, and, and basically kind of do everything right, so to speak, like, on, on the surface. But I would argue that there is, because of your sin nature, some part of you that, that does those things um, mm, you know, out of evil. As some people don't like to like go that far with it. I, I do, but it's not necessary. Basically, uh, what it's essentially saying is there's not any part of you that is like wholly good because whole goodness is Jesus Christ. Whole goodness is orienting yourself entirely towards God. Maybe you can kind of portion it up and say like, oh, well, you know, your feelings for your children are wholly good, but you still have like evil feelings other places. Like, that's fine. We can talk about that. That's kind of like in the weeds about Total, uh, radical corruption or total depravity but basically um it just says that our, our beings are not wholly good um even when we do something good um there, there's 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 some part of our nature or some part of ourselves that, that is still that, that, that still um twists the good and 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 so like let's say that um 
say that I ran for governor and then I became governor and I passed some law about abortion. Okay. Well, that's good. Like that's objectively good or right? like banning it. But all of my reasons and intents behind that, if they're not 100% in line with God, I didn't do good. I didn't do true good. Does, it, does that make sense? There's a difference between um, holistic, perfect goodness, which is like what Jesus is. When Jesus says there's nobody good except the father um, or except God, he actually doesn't say the father, which is interesting. Um, because I think he might be talking about himself in that passage too. I've debated this with people, but I think that it's like particularly Sam Adams hates the fact that I believe that because he's a Unitarian. But um, I think Jesus is kind of sarcastically saying that um, uh, nobody's good except God. And while you are talking to God right now, you just don't know it because, because the guy didn't have good intentions. It's actually a really neat passage from Mark. Anyway, um, what, what, what sin nature really is for a Calvinist is that it, sin has, has infected us so much that we are spiritually dead. We can't do whole goodness. We can't, we can't actually do the thing that pleases God most, which is love him and serve him and worship him. That's what pleases God most, in my opinion, um, which I think makes sense. Uh, so, so to be in complete accordance with his will, like Jesus Christ was, that's goodness. Anything else is evil. Why? Because it's a distortion of good. It's not, it's not, it's not holistic good, perfection oriented towards God. Um, that's why, that's why Jesus says, uh, to the, the rich young ruler, you know, if you know how to good, if you are evil and you know how to good, give good gifts, how much more will God give? Be, because it's not that it's bad that the rich young, young ruler gives gifts. That's not what he's saying. It's that, you know, your gifts are not wholly good. You know, you're evil, meaning you're not wholly good. You, you have a orientation, a bent, a slant that twists good um, so that it is not no longer all good. Intention is very important in, in understanding here. Um, there's a difference between the intents of my heart. Do I do something out of pure righteousness, out of pure love for God? Am I completely in line with his will? Or do I do things as best to my ability, but still am hindered by my sin nature? Do I twist this? Is it still twisted somewhat? Sanctification is supposed to get rid of that twist, in my opinion. So that's that sort of that slant, that bent towards evil. You're trying to orient yourself more and more and more and more towards Christ. But even until you ascend and are glorified, you're, you're not going to you're not going to have a, a holy good nature. This is kind of uh, one of the important debates of the early church is that Pelagius believed that you could. Pelagius, you could believe you could reach perfection in this life. Augustine said, no, that's not possible. Uh, this is where you become Augustinian or Pelagian and semi-Pelagian. That's where this comes from. And, and it also kind of expounded on Augustine's beliefs uh, about, you know, what it means to be a sinner, what, what sin nature really is. And and essentially, uh, at base, it's not that humans can't do anything good at all, uh, like objectively or like, or like their actions. John Calvin called that civic righteousness when you did a good action. Um, it's not that like, it's like yes, like, like saving someone's life or, or protecting your family, those things are objectively good. That's a good action. But are you wholly good because you did those things? No, you're not. Because you have, you, you have been tainted by sin. Your, your nature is corrupt. Um, so, uh, and, and, and the clincher is, it's so corrupt that you can't choose God. Um, your sin nature keeps you from being able to choose God. Uh, because that is choosing God, aligning yourself with the will of God, submitting yourself to him. That is goodness. And if you can do that completely, if you can do that wholly, uh, you have reached, you know, the state of Jesus Christ. Um, on earth and in heaven because his will was in line with the fathers and never said um we have to be given a new heart in order for us to and this is honestly a, a topic that's kind of hard for me to tackle because it's strange like the old man and the new man but we have to be given a nature that allows us to choose god but even then we're still not in a glorified state we still sin so um it's it's kind of that weird you know new man old man dilemma but uh, like our sin nature is still there, but it, it's not, it, it no longer dominates us, I suppose is a good way to put it. Um, in Calvinism, your sin nature keep prevents you from choosing God. And that's why God has to regenerate you. That would be, oh boy, I don't know the passage from John, but in John, when Jesus says, you know, the flesh profits nothing and those who are born, maybe Paul says that somewhere else. I don't know, confusing my verses maybe. But basically Jesus says, those who see the kingdom of God have been born of the spirit. So you need to be born of the spirit. You need to be regenerated. That's Calvinist language. 
uh, in order to actually choose God. But once you are regenerated and can see God, now you have the ability to do what pleases him most, which is choose him, choose to love him. So uh, our sin nature is inherited because of the fall. Uh, and um, it has corrupted every part of our being so that um, we can't do pure goodness. And that's why Jesus calls the evil young ruler good, calls the things that come forth from the heart wicked, et cetera, et cetera. It's not that we can't do, like, it's not that there's not good mixed in. I think that's a good way of saying it. It's that like all the good we do has some evil mixed in. And sometimes we can do just almost pure evil with, with no good. But actually, I would argue it's kind of hard for humans not to at least do, have a little bit of good mixed in, um, even, even when we do evil things, um, because of our orientation towards God, our, our image bearing, uh, you know, nature, I guess, uh, it's a better way to say it. So um, that's kind of a misconception about Calvinism is that like, oh, it's like, we believe people are totally evil. Well, it's no, it's just like, we or do totally evil things. It's that like, you are evil if you aren't wholly good. And that, I think that's what Jesus means. Um, and you, you, you twist the good. I think that that Tolkien's conception of evil is, is a good one where it's like evil is kind of a distortion of what is good. So we do good things. Um, and absence of good is another way of describing it. I kind of like the twisting version better myself. Um, it's like we, we, we do something that should be good, but then we twist it to make it evil. Um, and, and the degree to which we do that varies, but, but it's hard for a human being or maybe impossible for him to do something that is wholly good, because that would mean that you are doing something in, completely in line with the will of God. And, um, uh, that's, it's a hairy subject, but um, kind of gone all over the place with it. But I wanted to make clear that Calvinists believe that our sin nature requires regeneration, but also that uh, we don't believe that, or at least you shouldn't believe that that means that people do holy evil all the time or, whole, or just total evilness or utter evilness is a better way to say it. Total depravity just means that we're depraved all over or we're radically corrupt. Every part of our being has been, been affected by depravity, but it doesn't mean we do wholly evil things. Um, but it does mean that we can't choose God, which is the most pleasing thing. That's, that's the, that's the, because if you can orient yourself towards God perfectly, um, that is the best thing in the world, I think, or it's our, it's our highest purpose, our highest you know, calling. So that's what we can't do. Uh, it, our sin nature necessitates that we cannot choose God without help we need help we need a new heart so can we uh maybe uh land the plane a bit here because we've been uh, going on for almost three hours here <laughs> uh, but i'm look we're having good discussion it's just uh it's almost dinner time here and i need to help in the kitchen feeding eight people is no joke <laughs> oh, i'm rambly apologies <laughs> No apology necessary. This has been a great conversation. Thank you guys. Uh, any final questions or comments or anything? Or I did have one more question that was probably directed at Colton from what he was sharing just now. Of um, I, I don't know if I can articulate this very well, but is what you're saying about the sin nature having to do with free will are you implying that like adam and eve had free will then they made a poor choice and sin entered the world and from that point the free will was taken from humanity that only god could choose for people to choose him does that make sense the way i'm asking that yeah essentially honestly i think that adam and eve is one of the more mysterious um happenings in history because how exactly they ate the apple is a little bit confusing um given i think the best it's a it's a mystery to me uh given the best interpretations of free will that i've, I've heard it, it's kind of mysterious they had something we definitely didn't possess they also lacked something that we didn't have adam and eve were sort of naive in a way, they were innocent. They didn't have knowledge of good and evil. So it's really hard to understand, I think, how that happened from our perspective, because we do have knowledge of good and evil. And I think that has severely changed. Uh, that knowledge of good and evil has what is what has given us the sin nature. Um, I don't think that, I mean, God is in control of everything, but I, I don't think that it was like, uh, we ate the apple and then he like, boom, sin nature. No, it's like the fact that we had this epiphany gave us the sin nature. It's like, it's like eating of the fruit gave us 
the knowledge of good and evil and then like we couldn't handle it um almost it is, well it says their eyes were opened right right so it's not like it's not like part of the curse was having that that sinful nature in part it, it was no by their own actions they afflicted themselves with the inability to choose the pure good right right and then so to answer your question what happened was once we once adam and eve did that uh their their nature change um so again charles spurgeon said free will has damned many a soul i was never led one to heaven we are free to choose within our nature but we according to our nature choose to reject God, unless God does something about that. And, and, and that is, I think, the unequivocal teaching of the Bible on human nature. Um, you need God to orient yourself towards him, because without him, you are lost. So before Adam and Eve sinned, they could have chosen God or could not? Well, or which, which of those two are you saying? Well, Adam and Eve weren't, uh, they weren't sinning until they ate the fruit, I think. Some people disagree with that. Like, this is a hard subject. Um, but theoretically speaking, I think what the Bible puts forth is that the world was good and Adam and Eve were good, doing good things, tending the garden, whatever, until they decided to do this thing. So... So Adam, Adam and Eve were oriented towards God until they ate the fruit, which is where, which is where the mystery comes in. Why did they change? Right, right, right. Why did Adam and Eve stop having a holistically good intent? Um, and yeah, I, and what I'm kind of wondering about that is, is that the free will that Eve was talking about? Is they had the free will to choose God or to not choose God, and they chose to sin instead. And then from that point on, are you implying that God stripped humanity of its free will? No, our nature changed. So again, this is important to what Anne said earlier. Um, before their nature was not, I don't even know, they, were, they didn't have knowledge of good and evil. So again, it's hard to describe. I don't think this is, personally, I don't think this is a place that, um, I think it's mysterious. And I don't think we'll know the answer. I, I don't think we can confidently say exactly what happened with Adam and Eve because it's very weird for us because I think it's different now. I, it's, I, you can't turn away from God once you turn towards God. And then we can get into apostasy another time or something like that. But, but if you can see the light, you don't close your eyes and stop seeing the light. Um, Adam and Eve kind of went through the reverse. They, they saw the light, but then chose to turn away from it. But they didn't have knowledge of good and evil. So... It, it's hard to understand the position of Adam and Eve. What I believe at base, to try and help, I guess, is that Adam and Eve made a real choice to turn from God. Um, it's all I'll say, go in free will if you want. I just say they'll made a real choice. God did not force them to not choose him. They had consequences. Their natures changed when their eyes were open. That had consequences for all of humanity. All of our natures are different now because of what Adam and Eve did. And we are free to choose within our nature. God does not force us to reject him. We reject God all on our own. He doesn't, he doesn't control us. We reject God all on our own. Yeah, that's, that's, that's something like free will. I think it's not libertarian free will, but again, it's kind of more in the weeds. We reject God freely. So God could either just let everyone damn themselves because they all reject him, or he could save people. And that's why I think he does. He saves people, but he has to do something in order to save them. Um, that's why when you're saved, it's so wonderful because he could have just let you die, but he didn't. And there's nothing better about you than the guy next to you. See, if this is not true, then there's something inherently better about you that allows you to see who God is versus the guy standing next to you. And I just don't think it makes any sense. Um, and, and, and that's where, again, the practical applications of Calvinism become very real. Um, we can talk about like, you know, the free will problems, but then that's, a, that's an issue too. It's like, okay, well, what is different about your free will that then the guy standing next to you who doesn't choose God, it's like your free will is better. 
Uh, you have different experiences. Aren't those experiences given to you by God? Didn't God choose the time and place in which you were going to be born? So ultimately, I think everything reduces back to what Calvinism says, but yeah, it just can take a little while to get there. Well, I definitely have a lot to chew on now. Thanks, you guys, for um, kind of displaying Calvinism for me to work through all my way to this. That was a real joy to meet you. Yeah, you as well. Yeah, I really enjoyed the conversation, guys. I think I talked the most, but I expected <laughs> that because I talk a lot. So um, apologies if anybody else wanted to get more words in. I could... We could do it again and I could sit back uh, a little bit more, but, uh, but I, I'm, I'm gracious that you guys listen, you know, so. Yeah, it's good because then you get all the pushback. <laughs> what did you say? I said, it, it's, it's all good because then he gets all the pushback. <laughs> this is true. Yes. Yeah, it was great talking with you guys and I definitely need that. Well, I guess, uh, I guess we're done then, eh? All right. <laughs> I think that wraps it up. Uh, maybe there'll be a part two, who knows? Um, but, uh, yeah. but, uh, it was definitely a good part one. Uh, like I said, it was a little more propositional than, than I thought it was going to be, but it ended up being that way. So maybe we can get into a little bit more experiential Calvinism maybe on the next one because that's where it really shines for me in particular uh living out Calvinism is awesome oh so good so uh but I think we got into a little bit so we didn't solely hit on uh you know facts and logic Ben Shapiro type but I uh, really enjoyed the conversations anybody else have anything to say before I restop or I stop the recording I'm good Happy New Year. <laughs> Happy New Year. <laughs> All right. Hope everyone enjoys this. See you next time. Bye, guys.